You can actually eat foods that will actually help you create more brown fat, which is really astounding. Wow. All right. Like foods can create more fat, but good fat, paper thin fat, wafer thin fat that actually burns down harmful jiggly fat. How do people melt the fat, Dr. Lee? <laughs> we are, we're living in a time now where half the population almost is not just overweight, but obese. How do we solve this? You know, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, and I want, I like to start by basically saying that my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, the title is a little bit of a trick title because it's not a diet book. It's kind of an anti-diet book to say how we can actually improve our metabolism, fight body fat, and actually elevate our health, which is the real goal, our inner health, without ever having to go on a diet. Mm. So saying that, I can tell you that the whole idea about body fat it's loaded. The word fat is actually a real loaded term. In our society, it's um, associated with a lot of negative connotations, right? Um, when you think about fat, it's usually something not that you don't want. Even if you walk by the butcher section of the grocery store, you see that rind of fat around a steak. Yeah, you know, you'd rather not have that, right? Um, but it turns out, and this is what I write about, that there's a new science to the body that gives us new appreciation of what fat actually does and how that connects to our metabolism in ways that we never thought actually existed. So that fat itself is not a harmful entity when you've got too much and you got obesity, it is harmful. But up until that point, actually fat, believe it or not, is a human organ. Mm. It's an organ as important as your pancreas, your liver, your spleen, your heart, your lungs, and it actually fulfills very, very important purposes for our everyday health connected to our metabolism. And most people think about fat as something that grows on you. And when you see it, you don't like it. So we all went through this. We've all gone through this, right? Get up in the morning, take a shower, step out of the shower, out of the corner of your eye. You see in the mirror a lump or a bump that you don't want to be there, right? That's what makes you think about body fat. But actually, most people don't think about the fact that body fat actually existed before we were born. Hmm. And that leads us, I'm a scientist, so I like to ask origin stories. Where does fat come from? And fat starts in the womb. Wow, it starts in the womb. And certainly the fat that we are packaged with in utero, it's not bad in any way. It's prob probably probably is, is performing a a vital function for life. Yeah, let me explain that to you. So when your mom's egg met your dad's sperm and they got together, formed a ball of cells, it's gonna be the future you, <laughs> right? When they started to make tissue that will ultimately be your organs, the first tissue that got laid down were your blood vessels because every organ needs circulation, so that gets laid down first, right? So this is like building a house. What goes down first? Well, blood vessels get created when we're, when we're created. Uh, second tissue that gets laid down are nerves. And why that? Because every organ needs signaling to be able to tell them what to do. And so your nerves send those signals, right? Seems pretty fun. Like if you were creating a blueprint of a body, those would be the two things that you do. And that's actually what happens. Third tissue that gets laid down, surprisingly, is fat, wow. body fat. And they're called, the fat cells are called adipose uh, cells. Adipose uh, is, is another word for fat. And they actually form around blood vessels, kind of like bubble wrap. You know, if you had a uh, blood vessel and you were to wrap bubble wrap around it, that's what fat looks like. Now, what does fat do? And why is it wrapped around? Because fat cells, adipose cells, actually are fuel tanks. Hmm. Um, fat actually stores fuel. And the fuel is absorbed from the blood, gets into the fuel tank, and so that makes total sense why they're actually located that way, right? Hmm. So then after that, the rest of our organs start to build all around that. This just tells you how important fat is from the get-go. Fast forward nine months, baby is born. What do you call a beautiful, healthy baby? A fat, pudgy, chubby baby, yeah. right? Big fat cheeks, round tummy. Uh, uh, think about it, like their arms and legs are like those balloons in a circus where you, you know, they make poodles out of it. Literally, the, yeah. The, the clown makes it, right? Like literally, they look mm -hmm. like that, right? So there's something great, important, and healthful about fat in utero, very important for survival, and also when we're born, right? But we don't tend to think about fat in that context. 
by con by uh, by sort of counter distinction, if you actually saw a baby when they were born and they had chisel cheekbones like a fashion model and they had thin arms and long thin legs like like on a runway, you would be taken aback. You'd go, man, there's something wrong with that baby. Yeah, right. And you'd be right. Okay, so a fatless baby, a thin baby, lean baby is not well. Okay, so this is my kind of reset for you to, to rethinking body fat is actually one of the things that I write about. Like we need to have a complete uh, reconceptualization and, re, and a new understanding of what fat actually does. Yeah, so what is the, what is the fat doing for the baby during that, that stage of life? Okay, the, what the fat is doing for the baby is actually a continuum of what fat does for our healthy bodies for the rest of our lives. And so this is sort of the, the goodness of fat that's hidden beneath the kind of the perception of the badness and the actual badness. So I'm not denying that excess body fat is harmful. It's very harmful. We're gonna get into that in a second. But before we talk about the harms, it's so easy to jump into the demonization in the health and wellness space of things. I'm a scientist, I'm a doctor. Let's talk about the good stuff first so we can understand You know, when does good become bad? Mm. And that way we can know how to restore the good, right? That's I'm with good. you. Yeah, okay, so first of all, Fat, as I mentioned to you, is um, an organ, uh, and it performs multiple functions. As an organ, what kind of organ is it? it turns out to be an endocrine organ. Uh, it produces hormones, like your thyroid, like your adrenal glands, okay, like your pancreas. And that's an amazing thing, because we don't normally think about our fat as an organ. Most organs are just a, a chunk of something connected to tubes. Mm. Well, fat's actually a kind of organ that is just distributed throughout our body. And what does the fat produce as a endocrine organ? It produces hormones, 13 different hormones that are known currently. Wow. All right. And three of them I want to mention because I think it's important just to give some examples of what this hormonal function of fat actually is. Remember, we're talking about health. We're talking about healthy fat, healthy body from baby to uh, you know end of life. The first hormone is leptin, made by fat. And many of you may have heard about leptin. Leptin is sort of the appetite controller, right? More leptin, less appetite, less leptin, more appetite. So it's kind of like a volume switch for your hunger, all right? And that's important because when your fat actually is controlling your brain to go search for food so you can load up on fuel because the fat cells are fuel tanks. So you can kind of see how this all starts to fit together now, all right? Now, fat... So that's one hormone. Most people may have heard of leptin before. Another hormone that f people that have not heard about, or at least very few people have heard about, is called adiponectin. Hmm. Adiponectin is another fat hormone, okay? Uh, it's a very important one, and it's completely concerned with helping your body gain energy from the food that you eat, hmm. all right? In fact, it works as a partner with insulin, which is a hormone that helps energy. So let me tell you, if I were to take a vial of your blood Send it to a regular hospital lab to analyze your hormone, your hormones. Your adiponectin levels and mine would be 1,000 times higher than any other hormone in your body. Wow. Higher than testosterone, higher than thyroid uh, hormone, higher than cortisol, anything else. Now, why is that? It's because adiponectin partners with insulin to make sure that the energy that you have from the food that we eat is efficiently absorbed into our bodies. That's our metabolism. It's part of our metabolism. So good, healthy levels of fat perform this function to bring in energy along with insulin. It's very, very important uh, sort of as a foundation for our energy. Now, there's a third hormone I want to mention. It's called resistin. Hmm. Resistin is like the brake to adiponectin. That's the gas pedal. Gas pedal goes down. Let's absorb lots of energy, fast, hard. Resistant is like, whoa, let me, let's put on the brake here, a little bit less, all mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, most systems in the body are about balance, okay? Leptin uh, up, lo less appetite. Leptin down, more appetite. Adiponectin down, you actually have more efficient energy absorption. Uh, resistant down, the brake, actually pull back on energy absorption. Makes sense, because we want to fine tune our, our metabolism from day to day. So that's one very important thing that normal healthy fat does. It's a setup in the womb. The babies start to do it right away and it continues throughout our lives. This is how we normally function. Now, a couple of other things that fat does as well besides being an endocrine organ. It's a cushion. 
Now, most people think that fat might be a uh, like insulation, kind of like blubber on a whale. No, nah, it's more of a cushion. Think about fat like peanuts that you might pack your, something you're shipping across the country in. Yeah. All right. If we had no body fat, all right, and the most important body fat for the cushion actually is inside our frame, hmm. packed inside our belly. If you had no fat and you tripped on a rug and you fell on the gro- ground, your organs would burst open. So fat actually has sort of a cushion uh, role as well. Now, the other thing that fat actually has a very important role on that's fascinating uh, is that it's a space heater. And a space heater, so this isn't just passive, you know, like again, like the blubber is just passive. Um, The cushion is kind of passive, but this is an active function, just like the hormone. Instead of releasing hormones, it releases heat. Wow. Now, let me explain to you, not all fat generates heat. Hmm. So the new science of the metabolism tells us, broadly speaking, there's two color, two kinds of fat in our body. There's white fat, which is jiggly. <laughs> the white fat that's under the skin, is meaning close to the skin, we call it subcutaneous. That's the stuff you see under your arm, under your chin. That's the muffin top, all right, around your thighs and your butt. That's the stuff that most people don't like want to get rid of, um, uh, you know, If and I have no problem with that. I, that's a good thing. If you feel good by streamlining your body, go for it. Yeah. Like that, that's an important thing. Uh, and too much of it is also bad for you. But the other thing that's really important is that uh, another kind of jiggly fat is actually packed inside your body. That's the visceral fat we were talking about earlier. Now, visceral fat doesn't care if you have a big size body, like a weightlifter in the Olympics, or a thin body, like a javelin thrower in the Olympics, mm. it can grow inside. And that fat is sort of like the peanuts for packing that we talked about, except when it starts to grow excessively, it goes from being a packing peanuts into turning into a baseball glove that wraps around your organs and chokes your organs. Ooh. And it can happen whether you're apparently thin or you uh, obviously if you actually have excess weight. All right, that's white fat, both not so good for you. Visceral fat, deadly. So both the subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat are white fat. Correct. Got it. Right. Now, the other kind of fat that's not white fat, the other kind, is called brown fat. You know, you're starting to see and hear about brown fat, you know, and, you know, you see it online, you see some advertising for it. You know, a lot of uh, people in, uh, in the weightlifting world and bodybuilding world talk about brown fat. I'm not coming from that sector. I'm I'm coming at this really as a scientist and a doctor. And let me tell you something about brown fat. It's absolutely fascinating because only recently have we discovered that humans have not just a little brown fat, but a lot of brown fat. And brown fat is different than white fat because it's not jiggly. It's not lumpy, bumpy, jiggly. It's not under your arm. And it's not definitely not subcutaneous. You can't see it. It's Mm. not under the skin. Brown fat is paper thin, wafer thin. Okay, so think about it. Fat as thin? Wait a minute. That seems to be a contradiction in terms. But yeah, brown fat are thin sheets, and it's not close to the skin. We can't see it. It's close to the bone. Mm. All right? It's deep. And it actually is plastered around our neck, plastered underneath our breastbone, around like a girdle around our, our chest, under our arms, a little bit in the back, a little bit in your belly, scattered. Okay? And that fat has space heater function. Wow. It's like a nuclear plant that can fire up when it's stimulated in order to burn energy. So it really actually activates your metabolism. And as it does that, it needs fuel, Hmm. right? The space heater needs power. It needs gas. um, It needs to get fuel. Where does it draw the fuel? Where does brown fat draw the fuel from? Brown fat draws its fuel to burn from white fat. Hmm. So brown fat is good fat that can fight White fat, when it's bad fat, fat versus fat. Wow. Another another totally interesting thing that you would you can actually think about fighting fat with fat. It's like a civil war happening in your own body. Uh, yeah, exactly. E- except that you basically they're all they all started out being friends and all started <laughs> out creating kind of a peaceful society. Yeah, well, the, they should. I mean, ideally, we'll return to that. So, how do we then? You've mentioned what brown fat does, and you, you mentioned where it tends to. Uh, habitate in the body. Mm-hmm. How do we how do we stoke that fire, and how do we encourage its proliferation if it's so good for us? Can we even do that? Yeah. Well, look, I, I want to tell you a little story about how brown fat in humans was discovered because it's so fascinating. 
I, I think that there's so much to be learned about the origin stories and the history of things because it just gives us a better appreciation that this isn't just a trend or a fad. This is something real that was discovered over time. Okay, so in the um, 1700s, uh, there was a um, uh, a naturalist, you know, kind of somebody who studies nature named Conrad Gessner. He lives in Switzerland, and he was really interested in understanding animals and the anatomy of animals. So he, he uh, was actually taking a look at um, a rodent that lived in the Swiss mountains uh, that um, uh, would hibernate and he would catch one and dissect it. And you know, like they do in the old school they, they, they would draw the organs. And he found one organ that was between the shoulder blades and he didn't know what it was. Brown colored, but didn't look like anything else that was out there. Well, fast forward, actually, um, uh, a professor at UCLA took a look at that, I mean, over time and started to really, we had, there were more uh, sophisticated lab tools and said, you know what, that brown thing actually is made out of fat. Hmm. And the idea of this is that they thought maybe it was something only in hibernating animals. So then they started to find it in bats and other kind of animals that actually hibernate. Okay. And they said, well, I wonder if it's in humans. Fast forward a little bit further, they found it in babies, human babies. You know where they found it in human babies? Right. Just like in this rodent in Switzerland, they found it between the shoulder blades. Hmm. When babies are born, there's a little lump of brown fat um, that actually is there. Wow. Now, what did they figure out the brown fat did in hibernating animals? Is that when the animals are uh, surviving over the winter, they need, they need a space heater. So brown fat fires up and keeps them warm. All right. Now, what now what about human babies? Why do we have that? Is it a relic of evolution? Um, you know, look, babies are born in delivery suites. We can put them into incubators. You know, they're in warm homes. Uh, why do we need them? So the idea that was originally thought is, you know, it's just maybe vestigial, like an appendix, all right, which we know now it actually has a function because it actually harbors gut microbiome as right. well. All right. So you don't want to be, or your tonsils, hmm. right? Like people used to say, let's whip out the tonsils, whip out the appendix. No, no, no. Like that, they're actually form, they're actually important components of our body. All right. So brown fat in babies. Um, is it vestigial? No. Actually, it serves a function. And what they've found is that, and they thought, well, maybe, maybe when the babies grow up, the brown fat just goes away, just kind of melts away. Turns out that researchers in Boston were once looking at um, a woman who came in with a tumor in her chest. And they uh, did a biopsy, looked at the biopsy, and it was made out of fat, okay? And in fact, it was called a hibernoma because hmm. it resembled the hibernating animal's mass, organ. Wow. Okay, oma meaning tumor. And it wasn't malignant, all right? But what they thought they was really interesting is that when they scanned it using a PET scan, which captures met metabolic energy, in other words, what you deem to generate heat, this baby in this tumor, this little tumor, hibernoma, this brown fat tumor, lit up like a nuclear engine. Wow. Okay. And it was only because we had PET scannings at that time that it could actually even be figured out. Hmm. So the researcher that did this uh, in Boston, Ronald Kahn, actually went back and said, I wonder if, there, if this um, signal uh, exists in other PET scans, uh, met metabolic scans in other people. So he went back and dug up thousands of other scans that were done and found, yeah, actually there are people that are showing this brown fat throughout their chest and we just missed it. Wow. Like it was there, but we weren't looking for it. So we just kind of ignored the signal, but not everybody had it. So what he then did is he said, went back and said, you know what? It was in hibernating animals that they saw it way back when in the old days, right? Conrad Gessner. So he said, let's go back and match the PET scans with the temperature of the day in which the scan was taken. Mm. So we went back to the meteorological record and found every time a patient had a PET scan that shown brown fat in the body, it was on a cold day in the wintertime. And on warm weather days, it was cooler. So this space heating fat function that lives in adults as well as babies, as well as hibernating animals, truly has a physiological function to help generate heat. It is a space heater. Wow, it's fascinating. I always thought that it existed in babies. I heard once that babies are unable to shiver. 
Is there any is there any truth to that? You know, I don't know if babies are able to shiver or not. I think they actually can shiver. Mm. Um, uh, in fact, I'm quite certain that they can shiver. Mm. But I think that babies also um, uh, have this uh, physiological ability to fire up from the inside. Wow, it's amazing. So, so that means that cooler temperatures can potentially encourage the 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 activation of this type of brown fat. Does it actually um, encourage the proliferation? Like if we, you know, can can we actually create more of it if it's so benevolent? Well, I'll tell you how we can create more of it because there's foods that can actually help to create more of it. Which foods. is really, yeah, you can actually eat foods that will help you create more brown fat, which is really astounding. Wow. All right, like foods can create more fat, but good fat, paper thin fat, wafer thin fat, that actually burns down harmful jiggly fat. Whoa. That, that's really, and this is by the way, why I titled my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, because the new science of the metabolism that goes into this whole new science of fat tells us it's not so simple as calories in, calories out, you gotta work out. Think about what you were just implying with your questions. Does that mean that temperature can actually help us regulate? Absolutely, sleep in cooler temperatures helps to activate your brown fat when you're sleeping. Amazing. Yeah, I have a, I have a, I sleep with a, um, one of these uh, mattress pads that cools my mattress. Mm -hmm. It not only increases, it improves my sleep quality, but that's cool to know that it that it's probably encouraging the proliferation of this of this helpful fat. And it also helps you sleep better, builds your immunity. There's all kinds of new things that we're beginning to realize that cooler temperatures when we're sleeping, which probably mimics sort of the natural state of the outdoors at night, the temperatures drop. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's only in a house with a thermostat we crank up to have sort of warmer temperatures at night. Yeah. Do you have a, a, is there like a specific temperature that we should aim for when setting our thermostats at night? You know, people talk about this kind of a range. It's probably between 65, 67 degrees. It's sort of under 70. It's not freezing. Like you, you don't want to be shivering at night. Right. All right. But it's sort of in the high 60s. Hmm. Okay. So sleep Make sure that you're sleeping in a cool environment. But what are what are these foods? Okay. The thing that I found so amazing that I write about my book is uh, that foods will actually uh, click on your brown fat to burn down harmful white fat. It'll elevate your metabolism. It'll also help you lose weight and it'll shrink your waistline by killing off, by shrinking visceral fat, that harmful gut fat. Hmm. All right. So before I talk about the exact foods, I want to kind of just give a little more depth to understanding how the healthy parts of fat that we've just been talking about, because we've just spent you know a little time talking about healthy aspects of fat. Don't fear your fat. You don't want to get rid of it. You don't want to cut it out, burn it out. Like you, you want it. You want your fat. Yeah. And by the way, you don't want to poison your fat either. That's what do you mean by that? It. Well, I mean, you know, like people are developing, as, as you know, like in the news, are talking about it all the time ways to block obesity and, you know, and can we actually target fat and get rid of fat that way? We have to be really careful. You don't want to interfere with these normal healthy functions of fat, the fat that the baby has, the fat that we normally have to operate our organs. So let me explain basically a little bit about metabolism, fat, and then food. And then we can talk about which foods actually will really be helpful for ramping up your benefit. Right. So um, think of your car, uh, think of your body as a car right? So what is metabolism? Metabolism in your body is basically like the way that your car transfers fuel to run its engine. You want to get from point A to point B, you're going to drive your car. The engine needs uh, fuel, it needs gasoline. And so you're driving your car and you're paying attention to the fuel gauge. When the fuel gauge looks like it's heading to empty, what do you do? You pull over your car, go to a filling station, take out the gas pump, put the nozzle into the gas tank, fill it up, all right? And then when it, the gas tank is full, the, the nozzle goes click, no more gas, put it back and you drive off with a full tank, right? Mm. Now in our body, our body requires, it's basically an engine. Our metabolism gives our engine, our body engine, all the fuel it needs. The fuel that we get in our body isn't gasoline. The fuel that we have comes from our food. Now, people have used the term calories to describe that energy unit, but I don't want people to get focused on the calories because people tend to get too fixated on how many calories, counting calories, calories in, calories out. I would explain something to you in a, in a maybe easier to understand way. Food that we eat is our fuel. When we eat uh, our food, 
our body senses fuels loading up, just like we're at a filling station. So what happens is that our insulin levels go up because we are having food in our body. Insulin is that wonderful hormone produced by our pancreas that draws in the energy from the food that we just ate into our cells. So just to power up our, our cells, we need to have enough energy. Anything extra gets put away into the fuel tanks, which you remember in the womb, our fuel tanks were our fat cells. Mm. Little tiny fat cells that run, ring around the blood vessels, they actually get filled up. Um, you can fill up, you can stretch a fat cell hundreds of times. Wow. Okay. Um, so, but, but if you put in a little extra fuel, it's just there. You're loading up your fuel tanks. When you're not eating, your insulin levels go down. And then your body says, okay, now we can switch over to fuel burning mode. It's kind of like when you pull over to fill up your car, uh, fill up your gas tank, you turn off your engine, you're not burning any fuel, right? So when you're done fueling up, you can turn on the engine and go drive and start burning the fuel again. Right. Body's done the same way. All right. So now uh, when we're done eating, insulin levels go down. Our body, our metabolism switches into fuel burning mode. Makes perfect sense. Where does it get the fuel? It gets the fuel from blood, anything in the cells. And then when it needs to, it taps into the fat. Hmm. All right. Now, then you're driving off. And then what happens is when you actually, your fuel cell, when your fuel runs low, our brain senses that gas tank says is low. What do we do? We don't pull over to a gas station. We pull over to the dinner table, <laughs> to the restaurant, to the refrigerator, to the pantry. All right. So you can kind of see this is a very, very common sense way of understanding our metabolism, which, which can be very complex if you talk to a scientist. I'm trying to boil it down to something easy. Now, here is something interesting. Remember I told you, when you're not eating, you're able to burn energy. And that energy is stored in fat cells, which can get bigger and bigger and bigger when uh, you actually eat more and more food, fuel. All right. So when you're not eating, like sleeping, we talked about sleep, you're actually burning fuel. So sleeping is a fuel-burning state. Mm. Our metabolism is naturally switching into fuel burning because insulin is low, we're not eating, and we're actually burning. And basically what happens when we get up in the morning, okay, it's burning, burning, burning all night. In the morning we get up, we, bre we breakfast, we break our fast, all right? So when we're sleeping, we're fasting. And this is basically where the idea of intermittent fasting um, comes from. It's just describing what we normally do. Yeah. And it's not just a trend or a fad or you know something, some crazy new, a kick that people should get on. It's actually very, very natural to our body. The longer we give our body time to burn without food, to be able to tap in, to do fat burning, energy sucking, shrink those fat cells, the more weight we're going to lose, the more fat we're going to burn, the more fit we're actually going to be, and the more our metabolism is actually going to rise. Mm. So basically, I want to kind of give you an example of how this might work in real life. Let's say you go to bed at 11 o'clock and you sleep for eight hours, so you get up at seven, okay? That's pretty typical for many people. Let's say that you eat dinner, so you have eight hours yeah. during that sleeping time. Let's say that you eat dinner at seven o'clock and you finish at eight, put your dishes away at eight o'clock. Now, no midnight snack, no dessert later on, no noshing, munching on chips or whatever sweets, but at eight, you're done. And then you actually just go about your way and you go to sleep at 11 you've gained three extra hours mm. to your eight hours. Now mm. you've gotten 11 hours of fat burning. All right, that's that's to your advantage. Yeah. Your body, your metabolism is burning. Now let's say you get up at seven, all right? Eight hours of sleep. And now you, rather than actually get up and do what your mommy told you to do, like we were all conditioned this way, get up, eat breakfast, hurry up, catch the school bus to get off to school, all right? Let's say you get up and you take a shower, you get dressed, you putter around a little bit, check your emails or do whatever to scroll through the news. Wait an hour. Okay, before you eat breakfast, before you break your fast, now you've gained an extra hour to have your body burn fat. So mm. now that's one hour in the morning, eight hours in the evening, three hours the night before. Okay, that's 12 hours. So you've taken half the day to burn, to up your metabolism by burning body fat. Mm. That's an easy way to think about intermittent fasting in a completely different way. It's not 16 and eight, 16 fasting, eight, eat, eight hours of eating. That's pretty intense if you wanna squeeze all your eating in eight hours, Yeah. all right? You might not be enjoying your food and might be able to socialize the same way. And there is something to 16 and eight that's been studied in animals and a lab, it's also been studied in humans. But I wanted to share, share with you that 12 and 12, 12 hours of 
fasting, not eating, just like I just described, compared to 12 hours of eating, also helps you burn fat and also helps you lose weight. It works as well. So you don't have to be an extremist to you know put the pedal to the metal to really, really go hard at fasting. Just ordinary kind of patterns will do that. Now, this is a setup for the food, by the way. <laughs> so I just told you that the uh, that the uh, way you eat, the timing of the way that, how you eat, actually can be uh, uh, very, very useful for fat burning. I also told you, by the way, this overload of gasoline, which I want to talk about in a second, um, is important. So how much you eat also makes a difference normally. Yeah. Before we get to the what. All right. So. Um, imagine you're filling your car with, with gas again. You're back at the filling station with your car. You get your nozzle in. The gas tank fills up. Imagine if you didn't have the click on the nozzle. Right. And the gas keeps on flowing out. What's going to happen? The gas goes up. It fills. It runs out of the tank, down the side of the car, around the wheels, pools around your feet. Now you are standing. It's fire hazard. Is hazardous, flammable, dangerous mess mm-hmm. because you've overloaded your fuel. Yeah. Let's go over to the body. <laughs> You're eating, eating, eating. Now, our body doesn't have a clicker on the nozzle when we sit down to eat. There's no automatic cutoff switch. So it's easy to overeat, all right? The more you eat, the more you eat, the more you eat. Now what's happening is that your insulin's up. It's using the fuel. Everything extra gets stuffed into fat. Now, those fat cells, remember I told you, can actually expand massively. Yeah. If you really overeat, you're going to stuff more fuel into the fat cells there's a limit to how big they can get, hmm. all right? So, but you still have more extra fuel, extra food, it's gonna make more fat cells. Wow. Okay, those get stuffed, okay? Then they go up, still not enough storage, make more fat cells. Now you can kind of see how overeating creates more and more and more and more fat. Yeah, that's the difference between fat cell hypertrophy and hyperplasia, correct? That's right. Yeah. So hypertrophy is actually the small fat cell getting stuffed and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, uh, uh, hyperplasia is actually when actually more of it actually starts to, to grow. And by the way, those ideas of hyperplasia, uh, hypertrophy is like what happens to muscle too. It gets bigger. Yeah. Hyperplasia is actually a kind of a pre-tumorous state. It's like mm. we use hyperplasia to describe pre-cancers. Wow. Cells are growing. That Should they be growing? They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And let me just tell you, when fat cells get um, are just being stuffed with fuel because you've overeaten, you actually need more more fat cells, so they make, your body makes more and more and more, and they get eat, all get bigger and bigger. When fat starts to get into an expanding mass, fat as an organ, just like any other organ, needs a blood supply. So when it outgrows its blood supply, it desperately seeks to grow new blood vessels to it. This is an area I study called angiogenesis. Fat needs to be fed. It needs oxygen and it needs nutrients. But if fat is so continuously overloaded, the center of the mass will start to die. It doesn't have enough oxygen. Ooh. That's called hypoxia. Mm. Hypoxia causes inflammation. And when you have inflamed fat, Remember, you're standing in that pool of flammable hazard, okay? Now you're actually got, the, the hazard is actually inside your body. It's not around your feet. Wow. All right? That f- growing fat has this flammable inflammation hazard, and that inflammation in that fat basically wrecks, destroys the normal function of the hormones in your body. It wrecks um, your fat's ability to produce leptin. Now you don't know if you're hungry or not hungry. Hmm. Maybe you're too hungry. Or maybe you're not hungry. They can't tell. And it destroys a diponectin. So even though you're eating, there's plenty of energy. You know what? Maybe you're not absorbing that energy very well. Now your blood sugars start to rise. And then resistant, uh, it doesn't even know what to do anymore. When do you put on the brakes? And you can kind of see how overeating by itself, okay? And we're going to get to the quality of the fuel in a second. But overeating in itself can easily... Uh, your body just tries to stuff away the fuel, but can easily tip things over the edge. And that, that, that tipping point actually is where good fat gets deranged and turns into bad fat. Wow. What a story. And is this the point at which the, the fatty, the free fatty acids begin spilling over and getting stored in quote unquote, non-professional storage sites in the body, like organs where you're not supposed to accumulate like fat. Your, like your liver. Yeah. Right? So you've heard about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Very common today. Which very common. And it has, it's it's actually tracks along with the obesity 
epidemic, pandemic that's going on around the world. And basically what happens is that you make fat, you make fat, make more fat, it expands, expands, expands. Now, remember I told you, your body's stuffing that fuel using the fuel tanks, all right? But at some point, you've got so much fuel, all your tanks are full, and now the fuel is leaking out of the tank. Hmm. And when it leaks out of the tank, it's got to go somewhere. And some cer certain organs start to absorb more of it, like your liver. So when your liver starts to collect fat, you are starting to be in trouble because your liver is a filtration system, the, the, the cleanser of your body, detoxifier of your body. Now you start to plug that organ up, you can't detoxify your blood very easily. So you can kind of see, by the way, it's starting to make sense now, right? Like how the simple behavior of overeating or not being mindful of the timing in which you're eating, so you're not giving your body enough chance to burn down that extra fuel, can have unintended and very deadly consequences. Yeah. Right? And that's where the, the science of, of the metabolism actually comes into play. So before we get to the what kind of food, what kind of fuel should we be eating, let's say, very simply put, the more time you can give your body to burn down extra fuel, the better your health is going to be. Hmm. Meaning... If you finish dinner, don't eat anything afterwards as much as long as you can. Like, I mean, just don't eat after dinner. We'll put the dishes away and don't eat. No more food. Yeah. All right. Then you get then you then you go to bedtime, then take advantage of the whole evening, and then don't eat breakfast right away. In fact, if you occasionally skip a breakfast, that's even better because now you're giving your body extra um, uh, fat burning, energy burning time. Hmm. All right. So rather than kind of like become like really rigid about intermittent fasting, I think if you have this self awareness that your body is naturally doing this, this is actually a, a pretty easy way uh, to actually start to leverage your body on your own behalf. Yeah. All right. I mean, at the very least, at the end of the day, you're skimming off a ton of calories that generally are not the best for you, right? Like the, the, the foods that people tend to eat when, when curling up in front of the TV to binge watch their favorite show, those tend to be not the most nutritious calories anyway, right? That's right. That's right. And actually, so that then gets to the, the quality of the food that yeah. you're eating, right? So think about it. Let's go back to the car because I think it's something that everyone can understand. Uh, you know that if you buy a brand new car, uh, they always tell you to put the highest quality of gas you can in your tank. Look, if you, in the beginning, if you actually put crappy gas in your tank, your engine's going to be running just fine. It can take it a, a while. But every, every day, you actually put poor quality fuel in your car. Your engine's going to suffer. Hmm. Guarantee you over the long run. It's not going to run as well as, uh, as somebody who takes care of their car by putting a higher quality of gas. So for food, it's the same thing. Our body, remember, our metabolism is really just kind of like an engine running the engine. So the food that we eat, which is our fuel, really is like the quality of our fuel. You hmm. put good quality fuel into your body, your engine's going to run longer. Okay, that's longer, healthier, more vibrant living. Okay, you put poor quality food in your body, Look, once in a while, you're going to eat something that's not so good for you, no problem. If you're generally healthy, you'll rebound. We're highly resilient. But what we're talking about are the people that snack, drink junk, you know, uh, harmful foods, uh, and don't and pay very little attention to quality food. Yeah. What are some examples of those? I mean, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. Sodas, mm. both regular sweetened and diet soda. By the way, the diet soda is harmful because it actually – Turns out that all the data is starting to accumulate is that the um, non-nutritive sweeteners that don't add, quote, calories into your body, so not fuel, supposed to be better, right? My diet, whatever, blank, um, tastes good. I love it. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you're not absorbing any of the calories, the energy. It's, it's actually what they call it, you know, empty calories. Like, this got nothing, all right? But those artificial sweeteners, the data is showing that it poisons our gut bacteria Ooh. down below. When that ecosystem is poisoned, that's, that, that's like dropping uh, bleach, you know, uh, over the Great Barrier Reef. Wow. You're starting to kill the organisms there. Those organisms are responsible for maintaining a healthy immunity, helping you lower inflammation. They produce a short chain fatty acids. They help you heal faster. And even your gut microbiome text messages your brain to release social hormones. So this is a, just one example of, of something that's not so healthy. Both uh, sugar sweetened beverages and um, and and uh, uh, artificially sweetened beverages is one worse than the other. If you had to pick, 
if I had to pick, uh, I would uh, prefer a sugar, natural sugar sweetened beverage. Hmm. I'll tell you why. Sugar is basically like overwhelming your metabolism. Okay, so a typical can of soda will have like nine teaspoons of, of, of refined sugar. That's a lot. If I gave you an empty glass and I gave you nine teaspoons of sugar and said, eat it, buddy. Yeah. You, you're going to go like, no, man, that's torture. All <laughs> no, right. thanks. That's what we're doing actually with soda. It's crazy. Right? Your body will get over it. Like it will not like it when all that sugar hits your bloodstream. Your insulin is going to cut you. Sugar will spike. Your insulin will go haywire a little bit. But you know what? You're going to, you'll, you'll recover. Don't worry. All right. The gut microbiome thing, when you poison that gut microbiome, that's a whole other order of damage. Wow. That's why I would, I think, I, that's what I would avoid hmm. the, the, the artificial sweeteners. Sometimes I drink uh, these non-nutritive sodas, so zero calorie sodas that are sweetened with stevia. Are those all right? So, so the data is still coming in on uh, stevia, monk fruit, uh, you know, some of the other non-nutritive sweeteners, like, like naturally sweet. They're super potent. Looks okay. They look okay. Like they they don't have a the same degree of harm hmm. on the gut microbiome, and that's really what I think a lot of researchers are looking at is is there a harm, an unanticipated damage to the gut microbiome? Because we now know that the gut microbiome is so incredibly important, uh, actually for for cognitive function as well, and and our mood. So it's not just regular metabolism and your blood lipids and your ability to heal, but but really really important. So. Uh, what I would say though, is that for people that are thinking about stevia, stevia, however we pronounce it, um, not so much in a, in a, you know, in a can of something, but if you're going out to buy stevia in the supermarket, be very, very careful to read the ingredient label of the package that it comes in, because many things say stevia on the, on the front. All right, but if you look, take a look on the side and read the ingredients, there's a lot more than stevia in it. Wow. Yeah, I know sometimes they package it with, um, they'll package it with monk fruit, erythritol, which is a sugar alcohol, but uh, very interesting. Would you say the dose makes the poison with these kinds of things? Like diet sodas, you know? Like if somebody's not a regular diet soda drinker, but every once in a while, you know, once a week maybe, they like to treat themselves. Yeah. Look, it helps maybe with, uh, even though we don't like the, we're not, we're not fans of the D word. It helps with like diet adherence. You know, is that something that you think is is the risks outweigh the benefits? Yeah. Well, look, I, I'm somebody who practices reasonableness, and I always say to people, and you know, my patients, I always tell them, life is for the living. So you want to make sure that you're really enjoying your life. And everyone has some does some things that's not so good for them. I think if you spend most of your time shoring up your body's strengths you can actually withstand and rebound and uh, from, you know, taking a hit or two. Yeah. Not going to be a big deal. I agree with that. But I do think that, you know, um, awareness is a big thing. You know, once you are aware that, you know, that there are certain things that are not so good for your body, you want to be away from it. By the way, we were just talking about sodas for a second. There's other damaging uh, substances, ultra-processed foods, uh, is another one that actually can be very, very damaging to your metabolism and also to your body fat. Mm, talk about those. Well, first, they, um, I think you mentioned this at the beginning, they tend to take the place of whole foods, fresh foods. And so when you actually have, um, when, you, when the diet, sort of the modern diet becomes predominantly ultra processed foods, stuff in a box that you heat up that's been pre-made uh, out of a factory. And many times... I always tell people, please look at the ingredient uh, that, and if there's like 20, uh, if there's 20 uh, items as ingredients and you can't pronounce most of them, or if you spot there's artificial preservatives, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavorings, you know, in Europe, they actually ban a lot of the artificial flavorings and colorings mm. that we actually have commonly in the United States. I've heard that. Right? So this is like, okay, now why does certain part of the world ban this to protect their citizens? And how come, you know, like... That's a choice that we make if we're going to eat it. So I would say, look at the ingredient label, you know, uh, trust, but verify. All right. And ve that verification will actually keep you out of trouble. Um, you know, in my book, I take people on a tour of the grocery store to look for metabolizing, metabolism activating foods. There's 150 of them. Um, but what I do is I actually take people into the forbidden middle aisles, right? People used to say, shop the perimeter. I want to tell people, you can actually shop the middle of the store. There is real stuff, good stuff in there. I, I call the chapter Treasure Hunt. So you <laughs> want to find the gold 
the real gold from the fool's gold. Don't get the fool's gold. Get the real stuff. And so the point is that what you want to do is to avoid that as much as possible, that ultra processed stuff. Too many people uh, make a habit, a daily habit of eating mostly ultra processed food. And what do those foods typically look like? Um, they're in a box, they're in a can, they're in a bag. Um, uh, they are loaded with uh, artificial preservatives. They're machined, extruded, reshaped. They're colored, <laughs> you know, spray painted, mix in, mixed with our, our different types of colors. And there's a lot of flavor enhancers as well, you know. And I think that that's, and, and by the way, that, that tends to develop habits because we become addicted to certain flavors. Hmm. Our brain you know, responds to certain signals that, that these chemicals that are placed in ultra processed foods make us more, uh, make us avidly seek them out. Interesting. So they make us, they make us inclined to overeat. Well, they, they, they make us inclined to pick that product, but once we're there, it becomes hard to overeat. I mean, most of us don't understand that, you know, like the, this new science of the metabolism breaks it down that the food we're eating is our fuel and it packs into our fat cells like once you have that picture in your mind like it makes it a little you, you can you can kind of check yourself a little bit about taking that extra serving or extra helping or extra bag of something yeah so what are these uh so what are these these hidden nuggets hiding within the aisles of our supermarkets because i typically i typically recommend people you know, dipping in very occasionally, but ultimately doing the bulk of their shopping around the perimeter of the supermarket. But what are these like these foods that you've identified as being particularly valuable? All right. So first of all, the foods I've worked on are, are, are all uh, been studied in the lab, but also have human evidence that they're beneficial in people. So, you know, I, I as a scientist, you know, like a, the lab is cool, but the proof in the pudding uh, the rubber meets the road is when actually you find that the the effect, the benefit is actually found in people. So 150 foods in my book, all that are benefiting your metabolism, burning bo harmful body fat, activating your metabolism. All right. So, and the way that I write about it, and then I'll tell you what, uh, we'll get to the middle aisle, is I write about this uh, to take the reader on a tour of the grocery store. So remember when you were a kid, you, you hopped into the shopping cart with your mom pushing you through the aisles. That's what I do with this book. Hmm. You hop into the, my shopping cart. I take you around. And I just tell you what to put into the cart. All right. And so obviously, and I'm 100% with you, shopping in the perimeter, going to the produce section, looking for the fruits and vegetables and legumes and, you know, all that kind of root vegetables. Absolutely. That's where a ton of good stuff is. It's almost obvious, although there's a lot of surprising new science about that as well. But- what I also do is I take people into the middle aisle, that forbidden section. And I think this is something that is very important to me is that if you want to stay on top of the new science of the metabolism and fitness and health, don't get stuck to these old kind of um, paradigms like stay away from the middle aisle. No, go into the middle aisle. Be aware that there's research has actually shown there's some good stuff in there. There's a lot of bad stuff in there, but there's good stuff as well. So what is a treasure in the middle aisle? Well, I will tell you one of them actually are um, dried chilies. Interesting. Ancho chilies, chili peppers, poblanos, the whole the whole uh, uh, chili is, is good. Or even the spice aisle, the, the powder chili or the or chili flakes you put on your pizza kind of thing. That's really helpful. Uh, even the, the chili that's in the jars of salsa, hot salsa can be helpful to you. Now, how is this? Now, I'm, I'm giving you the research explanation now. Turns out the chili peppers have something called capsaicin hmm. and capsinoid. These are natural chemicals that when you eat, they create the burn of chili, right? That zing on your tongue. Now, chili, the capsaicin binds on your tongue to a receptor. It's called trip V1. Don't worry about the Latin. Let the scientists deal with that. But hmm. I just want to give you the mental image of the hot, uh, the, the spicy chemical that's naturally present in chili peppers turning on a switch that's on your tongue that switch send a signal to your brain, all right? And then your brain, it tells your brain to release a couple of things. The one thing it releases is endorphins, feel-good hormones. That's why some people are addicted to spicy food. You, know, you like it. It makes you feel good, Yeah, all right? My little brother is, like, uh, obsessed. Right. Yeah. So his, his, his brain is releasing more or endorphins. But the second uh, uh, signal, the second hormone that the brain releases is much more interesting. It releases noradrenaline norepinephrine. 
Now that is a stress hormone. That so you know fight or flight. You know you're either going to put your dukes up or you're going to run away. All right. Well, that's an organ. That's a hormone that your brain will release that causes you to vasodilate and to sweat. That's why when you eat really hot stuff, you start to, you know, your, your nose runs. You know, you get you flush. Right. That's yeah. kind of, th- those are fighting words, right? Yeah. So like that's actually why why chili peppers do that. But the other thing that the new science of the metabolism teaches us is that the noradrenaline, that norepinephrine, runs down um, uh, nerves from your brain down to your brown fat. It turns on the space heater fat in your body. Wow. And when it fires up your space heater fat, you're burning down fuel from excess body fat, especially visceral fat. So this is where the good fat can fight bad fat, and you're eating it in chili peppers. Wow, fascinating. So Mexicans, man, because they eat a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in across different parts of the world, um, uh, Southwest Asia, China, uh, Vietnam, Thai, uh, Latin America. Uh, uh, yeah, you're right. Right? Lots of lots of fiery Calabrian chilies, you know? There's a lot of fiery chili. I know you like to cook. So, I mean, yeah. me too. So, I mean, we can talk about that. I mean, different genres, different cuisines incorporate hot chili peppers. And maybe that's a cultural, going back to history, maybe that's kind of, why chili peppers made their way into cuisine. Yeah. Because there was some inherent intuitive benefits to it. Yeah. I remember reading a study a couple of years ago that people who habitually consume spicy foods have a reduced risk of early mortality. That's right. Might actually help you live longer. That's right. That's right. And so we're starting to really kind of put together a picture and understand some of the mechanisms of why that might be. Hmm. And activating your metabolism is clearly one of them, fighting off that extra body fat, fighting off that the ability to actually have fat, in, inflammatory fat that spills over and over to your liver and you know makes it harder to detoxify your blood. All these things, this picture starts to make sense. It's fascinating. You know, I'm thinking about Japanese cuisine. They don't really make use of, of chili peppers. No, but Japanese cuisine uses other ingredients that can actually activate your um, your brown fat as well. Interesting. All right. So, for example, kombu, which is, you know, used in uh, miso soup. You know that little square dark seaweed that's pieces that are in, com- yeah. in, your, in your miso soup? That's kombu. It's kind of seaweed. And actually it contains um, uh, fucoxanthin, um, which is a natural um, substance that's present in seaweed. That activates your brown fat. Wow. Okay. And fish. I mean, uh, Japanese cuisine eats a lot of fish as seafood as their protein. Omega-3 fatty acids activate your brown fat. Fight your har- uh, harmful white fat. Uh, actually, what's amazing, uh, omega-3s actually start to convince white harmful fat to convert and grow more brown fat. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they basically try to get the white fat to switch sides. Do we know why brown fat is brown? Like, why do they call it that? Because uh, it contains, to, okay, so to fire up that space heater, it needs to have basically nuclear engines that can actually fire up the heat. Now, the engines in our cells, uh, in the human cell that fires up, is called the mitochondria. Hmm. Okay, mighty mitochondria, so I remembered it when I was in med school. Um, it fires it up, and the mitochondria has a lot of iron in it, and iron is brown. Wow. Never knew that. Packed with packed with these nuclear engines, packed with a lot of iron. Wow. Mitochondria are rich in iron. That's right. We really are star stuff. You know? The fact that, like, iron, that we're, it's such an essential part of us. Um, crazy. In your book, I noticed you talk a lot about the uh, a, a Mediterranean diet. What's that about? All right. So of these 150 foods that I labeled that you, that you can find them in every section of the grocery store, produce aisle, middle aisles, the beverage section, and of course the seafood section, not to forget that part of it, um, I, I take people through this. And what I wanted to do is provide a little bit of cohesion for people that are reading my book to say, well, how do you put all this into action? Like, you know, like, so what kind of food are you talking about? And so I get asked all the time, Dr. Lee, you study food as medicine. You're in pretty good shape. Tell me what diet you're on. And I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of times I'm asked this by people. And what I tell people always, what I, what I answer is that I'm not on a diet. I don't go for diets. I I don't think they're sustainable. They're not always, most of them are not very healthy. And some of them are fad and not based on science. 
and I'm all about inner health. Um, but the other thing I'm all about, I, I really enjoy the taste of food. Like I'm, I respect food. I respect the traditions of food. And I, and I love to explore different kinds of tasty foods. That's something I grew up with. You know, I have an Asian, Asian background. I grew up eating Chinese food. I lived in the Mediterranean. I, I took a gap year between before I went to medical school. Wow. I lived in Italy and in Greece. So like, you know, I've, I've walked the walk. And, I was, and this was so long ago, long before people actually even talk about the Mediterranean diet. And I was there to study food, culture, and health, like how it all integrated together. So for me, there's a joy, the joy of eating uh, actually involves naturally looking at genres of food that fit with uh, either Asian cuisine or Mediterranean cuisine. And I would wager that most people who might look at my book would say, you know what, I can get into that. I, you know, I like Japanese, I like Chinese, I like Thai food, or, you know, or I like Italian food, I like Greek food. I mean, they're popular cuisines. But the amazing thing, from these large epidemiological studies is that these genres of cuisines are among the healthiest mm. in the world, among the oldest in the world, and among the most developed in terms of culinary culture, right? So they go way back. So I call it Mediterranean. So I say, so how do you eat then? I eat Mediterranean style. That's who I am. It's not some fancy fusion blend, okay? I might be Asian, it might be Mediterranean, it might be a blend. I don't know, when I'm cooking something, I, I sometimes think, you know, can, can I, can I uh, tear a page from the playbook of each to create something that's good for myself? Um, and so people go, oh, well, that sounds really cool, Mediterranean. And it does have a nice, it does roll off your tongue nicely. Uh, but the key actually is it's not brand new. Hmm. And I love history. I think we so much, we're so informed by our history. Mediterranean is like 2,000 years old. Hmm. Why? Because 2,000 years ago, the Mediterranean and Asia was connected by the Silk Road. It's the greatest trading route in human history where people on desert care, people are in, it's a desert caravan. People are um, going back and forth between the Mediterranean and, and Asia and they were meeting each other and exchanging and selling ingredients, trading recipes, sampling of each other's cuisines. And so this goes way back, long before processed foods where people were much more in touch with their bodies. And I think that's really kind of like the, what I wanted to bring out is that, you know, the idea of actually eating to be your diet, elevating your metabolism, uh, using the new science isn't just newfangled stuff. Yeah. If you like to eat, check out my book because it's packed with the, I, the ingredients as well as some recipes that will actually make you like make you salivate because it just tastes good. Yeah, I love it. I love Mediterranean cuisine and I love Asian cuisine. I mean, I love, I'm obsessed with Korean food. Hmm. I mean, kimchi, you know, the Korean barbecue, we have great options here in, in Los Angeles where I live. I and, love ja And gochujang, you know, the, the, yes. the spicy sauce, chili pepper. Oh, it's loaded. Yes, right? it is. Yeah. Activate your metabolism. I love that stuff. Japanese food, you have, I mean, obviously seafood, sushi. I'm obsessed with sushi and sashimi. You've got natto. By the way, on Japanese cuisine, let's let's talk food here. Um, you know uh, the uh, ikura, which are the the salmon eggs. Yes, I love those. All right, packed with omega three fatty acids. Mm. So you don't have to have a, just a chunk of salmon. You know, like you know salmon or fish or chicken kind of thing at a wedding. You can actually have if you like that. Th that's actually a great source of omega threes. Mm. So what are the benefits of of ikura? You mentioned that omega threes actually can help can help uh, convert in a way, white fat to brown fat. Yeah, and it actually activates brown fat as well. Wow. So it turns on that, it's called thermogenesis because it makes heat. Thermo heat genesis makes. And so the, the bottom line is that like, you know, these little fish eggs, they tend to be really, really packed with omega-3s as well. Because they're little baby salmon, so it's just like con like all the good stuff in salmon concentrated into these little delicious orbs. Yep, that just little little explode in your mouth completely. Yeah. yeah, they're they're really really great, and you know other fish eggs are also uh, quite delicious to try as well. Um, I write in my book about so I, I you know I spent time living in Greece, and one of the common um, appetizers you know mezza that actually you would have shared dishes um, is something called taramo salata. And taro salada is uh, eggs, often cod eggs, um, uh, and uh, mixed with, um, it's made into kind of a paste. Mm. And it's delicious to, to just sample that and eat that. It's a mouthful 
of briny omega-3 fatty acids. Wow. Do you, do you recommend fish oil pills, like fish oil supplements? Okay. So th this kind of goes to the whole supplement section, and I talk about it in my book as well. I have no problem with supplements. Supplements are great. I mean, you know, some supplements are life-saving. Um, they can prevent birth defects. They, you know, help to... Uh, tee up your body, you know, to, to, to get, make sure you have all the, uh, nutrients that you need, micronutrients you need. I have no problem with supplements, except that I tell people to, um, see if you can get most of what your body needs from whole foods, more pleasurable that way. A supplement doesn't give you pleasure. It might give you what you need, but I tell people supplement, look at what the word supplement means to top off, hmm. get your stuff from food, enjoy it. And if you're not getting enough, top it off. Wonderful advice. I want to go back to um, to intermittent fasting, which I think uh, is, you know, it's a, it's a very hot topic, which is why I wanted to circle back to it. A lot of people are talking about it. There's a lot of advocate advocates for it. There are a lot of people that that find tremendous value. But then it, it you, online, you t you do get detractors of the of the 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 trend, right? Which is not really a trend because, I mean, intermittent, intermittent fasting itself is kind of a misnomer because we're all intermittent fasting. Every single one of us. That's right. Every night while we sleep. Exactly. But what does the data say when comparing, because um, I know there have been a slew of studies that come out on this recently, when comparing intermittent fasting to more traditional like calorie restriction? So again, I really sort of want to emphasize that Intermittent fasting is kind of what we do, as you said, every day. We're intermittently fasting when we're sleeping. We're intermittently eating when we're awake. It's not a big deal beyond that. And how you adjust your eating windows and when you close the time that you eat, you just close your eating window, you know, those things can be adjusted, fine-tuned. Um, I try not to stress about that because I think that the idea of actually comparing calorie counting versus intermittent fasting, uh, that's an artificial kind of, um, uh, that's a kind of an artificial competition. Mm. You know, it's not either or. I mean, frankly, if you're calorie counting, less fewer calories in, I mean, you're still doing it within a fasting window because at some point you're sleeping, you're not eating. So, right. you know, you could argue that people that are counting calories are also intermittent fasting anyway. So the question is whether or not counting your calories and lowering your intake actually can help to enhance intermittent fasting. And I think the evidence is, in fact, it does. So if you, if you try to optimize the time your body actually burns extra fuel by having more hours of fasting, if you, if you want to call it that, basically, uh, and then the, the time that you're eating you're, you're, you're cutting down your calories. That's the combo. Yeah. Right. Cause nobody's actually staying up all night or eating all night or, or eating all day, you know? So we're all, we're all doing that because we fall asleep. Yeah. And your average person today is eating literally from the minute they wake up. They're, they're digest, consuming, digesting, metabolizing calories from the minute they wake up until just before they go to sleep. Yeah. And that's actually bad for you. I mean, you know, like I know that there, there, there was a dietary trend where you're eating continuously you're saying, you know, you don't want glucose spikes and you want insulin spikes. So just eat a little bit all day long. That's definitely not good for you because what you need is you need metabolic rest and you need to be able to have this resiliency in your body of switching your metabolism from um, storing fuel and burning fuel. Like you want to keep, so when you're eating all day long, your, your, your body is signaling to your brain, hey, guess what? We got food all day long. Insulin's got to be pumped out all day long. All right. Uh, and it's your storing, all you're doing all day long is storing your fuel. It's like sitting and low, filling up your car, you know, rather than like driving until your tank is low, you're stopping every block to fill up, which you burn down. That's not, that's not good for your body for yeah. sure. All right. And high insulin levels, by the way, continuous insulin levels, not good for you because what creates insulin in your body? Your pancreas. All right. So wh what is it? Uh, how does your pancreas do it? Well, it, the, your pancreatic cells, they call them the beta islet cells, for those who care, actually create insulin by um, using a fertilizer, kind of a protein called insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, okay? And it needs this fertilizer in order to make insulin, right? It's like growing a garden. You need more fertilizer to grow the flower. You need IGF-1 to make more insulin. So when your insulin's up all the time, your pancreas is making making it all the time, IGF-1 goes through the roof because you just need to keep making it. It's like, it's like a, it's like a, like a 24 hour diner. It never stops. Mm. All right. 
Now, here's the stunning thing. Studies have shown that continuous high levels of IGF-1 are related to not only diabetes, but related to cancer. Cancer cells love excess IGF-1. They feed off of it. So the more you do that, the more likely you're going to trip yourself into a situation where you might actually develop cancer. Wow, nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. And that's actually your background, right? Cancer, you, you've, I'm a, you've, I, I'm, among many things, I, I'm, a, I'm a cancer researcher. I study cancer. I study blood vessels that feed cancer, field called angiogenesis. I've been involved with developing uh, many cancer, modern cancer treatments. I've treated cancer patients. The amazing thing, I mean, what we can actually do today to treat cancer with immunotherapy and targeted therapies unbelievable in terms of what we're able to do compared to when I went to medical school where it was chemo only. Now we can do very sophisticated things, but wouldn't it be better if we could prevent cancer in the first place? Mm. And that's where this awareness of what, how, how, is, how is it developed? Uh, what could we do to lower our risk factors? You know, um, like what is the equivalent in cancer uh, uh, of sort of wearing a bike helmet so you don't brain yourself? Yeah, and being overweight and obese, does that not put you at increased risk for Absolutely. the development of cancer? Absolutely. First of all, I mean, obviously we know that there's a correlation between overeating, continuously pounding calories, um, uh, which then spikes your insulin, which spikes your IGF-1, which you talked about. I mean, it's a high levels. That itself could actually be a trigger. But the other thing is, is as that fat cell grows, remember we, the, the load, fat cells load up, now you need more fat cells, make another one, make another one. Now you get a mound of fat that becomes hypoxic and inflammatory like we talked about. Now you have lots of inf inflammation in your body. Cancer loves inflammation. Oof. Inflammation fuels cancer. Inflammation in body fat, excess, excess body fat, not normal levels, excess body fat is literally like pouring kerosene onto the embers of a campfire. You will stoke it. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, if you can avoid being in that situation, absolutely do it. And if you're actually somebody who's in that situation where you're carrying around a lot of extra weight, well, this is what I'm saying is that we have the ability to, to actually fight body fat with our food because we can we actually try to get to the metabolism that our body wants to have, that we're born with. And that's something that I think is really important for us to talk about. There's some new discoveries that are just 24, uh, 24 months old, like two years sp spanking new about the human metabolism that blows our mind about how we can control body fat to allow our, our, our inner metabolism to get to where it wants to be. Wow. So what do you, like when you hear statistics like, by the year 2030, one in two adults are going to be not just overweight, but obese. Are we just like a powdered keg waiting to explode? Absolutely. We are. Well, it is. It's a, I mean, you know, I, I'll tell you, it's probably the analogy I would give is like, you know, I mean, as a human population and especially in developed countries, it's like we're in this fleet of Mack trucks driving towards this gigantic brick wall. We we can see it in the horizon and it's getting closer and closer and closer and we're speeding up. You know, it's not going to be a good outcome. Damn. Okay, so love to love to keep things like actionable for my for my listeners and my viewers. So we so we talked about intermittent fasting, which is super a super valuable tool, and, and we've already covered that. You talked about avoiding the sugar sweetened beverages like the sodas and stuff, juices, um, juices too. Would you would you put juices in that camp? You know, juices all, all come from whole fruits and foods. If you can get the whole food. You're going to get a lot more of the good stuff on it, but occasionally, every now and then, juice is fine. And I just want to explain that for a second. Yeah. So, um, you know, people criticize uh, orange juice because it's got it's very very sweet, and it is. Pomegranate juice is also very sweet, um, uh, but it's okay to eat an orange uh, because. And people say, well, don't, don't eat oranges. That's not true. Orange is pretty sweet. It's got a lot of fructose in it, but it's got a lot of dietary fiber. Think about when you peel an orange and you eat it. It's packed with fiber. Yeah. It's got other bioactives like hesperidin and narogenin. It's got vitamin C. And here's the difference between a whole fruit versus the juice. Tall glass of orange juice, you know how many oranges it takes to make a tall glass? How many? Eight oranges. Oh, man. Okay. So you can swig down a tall glass of orange juice in 60 seconds. 
All right. Drinking the sugar of eight oranges. But you would not be eating eight oranges at a time. No, after I eat one orange, it's not, I don't want to eat a second orange. Exactly. After I eat one apple, I don't want to go and eat a, get a second apple from and, the fridge. And, and that's the point of why, you know, every now and then, if you like the taste of a juice, you really want to do it, fine. But really, in every single case, it's better to go to the whole food and have that. Yeah. I wish grapefruit juice had zero calories because I love grapefruit juice. I don't drink it. Yeah. You know, again, I wouldn't think so much about the 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 calories. You could squeeze it. Okay, you can juice a whole grapefruit, um, or you can actually cut it in half and scoop it out and eat it, and now you get all the dietary fiber. That's what I do, yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love grapefruit. Okay, so juices, so generally juices we want to- I would say cut down. Yeah. And and if you have a choice, uh, you know, get it from the whole fruit. Yeah. We talked about ultra-processed foods. Mm -hmm. You want to generally avoid those. Yeah. And also processed meats. Tell Proce me about those. Well, first of all, the World Health Organization considers processed meats a, a class one carcinogen. Kind of enough said there. Mm -hmm. Some some world authority has decided that it's a, it causes cancer, but they're pretty down on meat in general, aren't they? Now this 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 all happened like animal long, products. This all happened long before that, and you know actually it's not quite true. If you go to Europe and you take a look at some of these great food cultures, I mean, uh, they eat a lot of beef, they yeah. eat a lot of pork, they eat a lot of, you know. So I would say that what it is is that the processing of meat. And I'm not talking about the you know, Sicilian or Calabrian sausage hung to dry, you know, uh, you know, over weeks. So we're not talking about that or like prosciutto or. Uh, you know, actually prosciutto has some beneficial uh, fats. Wait, what? It. Tell me about that. Well, it turns out. Because I love prosciutto. Okay. Well, look, there is, um, obviously this is for people who are listening that actually um, eat animal protein and who actually enjoy meat. And if you had to choose a meat to eat, okay, not- It's prosciutto? Know, uh, prosciutto or jamón de serrano. Wow. Serrano ham. And I'll tell you why. Not the stuff you get in a grocery store that's pretty inexpensive, um, like in a, you know, like a mini mart kind of thing. You, know, you can find sometimes prosciutto there. But if you go to the real deal, prosciutto de Parma, jamón de serrano bolota, Okay. Um, and I'm, I know I'm talking to somebody who likes, who's a foodie. Yeah. Like this me. is my favorite podcast I think I've ever recorded. <laughs> you are, you are validating one of my most expensive and indulgent habits. Okay. Let me just tell you. So the original pigs that are actually used to create prosciutto di Parma in Italy are fed chestnuts. Hmm. And, when, and chestnuts contain plant-based omega-3 fatty acids, a lot of linoleic acid and ALA. And so where does it actually go when the pigs eat it? It goes into their fat. And so the fat of prosciutto actually contains healthy plant-based fats. Wow. So you get a lot. Now, okay, look, if you eat a lot of it, it's pretty salty. Yeah. And it also has some, some saturated fats. But I'm also telling you that if you had to choose among meats, that particular meat, the original kind, yeah. made in the old country. Okay, Mediterranean. Actually, it's quite good. Same deal with the uh, Serrano ham, you know, the, the uh, jamón de bolota, Serrano bolota. That's, that's sort of the premium uh, uh, Spanish ham. They're fed acorns. Wow. All right. And so the acorns contain the same plant-based, healthy, pre-omega-3 fatty acids that the animal converts into omega-3s. And where does it go? It goes into their fat. So, you know, again, uh, it's... I, I'm not saying that prosciutto and hamon are health foods by any means. What I'm saying is that if you eat animal proteins and you want to have meat and you want to have some uh, processed meats, those two are the best of the bunch. Well, I think there's a you've you've kind of hinted at a distinction that we need to make between the different types of processed meats, right? Yeah. Like there's the way that humans have been quote unquote, processing meat for millennia, right? Like they've been doing in the Mediterranean region of the world. And then there's like the cured meats using sodium nitrite, right? Like the really cheap meats made using byproducts that are like left on the shelf to oxidize. Like there's gotta be a difference, right? Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying is that the traditional methods of curing meats are devoid of the modern industrialized chemicals that are actually put into meats. And so it doesn't make them um, healthier. It makes them less unhealthy if you eat a lot of it. All right. Mm. So the bottom line in general for, for animal proteins, cut down 
And and if you if you cut out, it's an ethical decision. I'm I'm okay with that too. But I'm saying that you know, like I'm an omnivore. I'm not a I'm not a vegan. That's a, that's a that's an ethical decision. I respect people who go that way. But you know, I I enjoy food, and so I'm willing to pick and choose different things that I actually enjoy. I know that plant based foods in general. Uh, whole plant-based foods are actually better for me. So I will gra- naturally gravitate to that or seafood. Animal proteins, you know, I, I listen, I'll, I'll eat meat every now and then. I'm just very picky about what kind I eat. I want it to taste damn good. And I don't want to be, you know, shoveling bologna into my into my mouth. You know, like when we're all grown up as kids, yeah. you know, it's like what your mom's putting put in your lunchbox and, you know, like at the, del- you know, at the school, whatever, the sandwich bar. Like that's the stuff that's out there. That's highly processed, industrialized processed meats. It's got a lot of different things in it. Um, I had a patient once, by the way, who was a former USDA inspector. He was a private contractor and went in there to basically check out um, processed meat factories. What he told me made me double think. This is long before, uh, you know, like I started doing food as medicine research. But he told me that there are actual processed meat factories, you know, the the make, you know, those like the sausages and stuff like that, that literally once they make the sausage, they throw them into a swimming pool full of chemicals Mm. to soak up all the chemical ingredients. All right. Yikes. And he said that the, the floor of these factories were so, um, toxic that he'd have to buy a new pair of boots every couple of months because they would dissolve the bottom of his, of his shoes. Wow. All right. And I thought about like that image always stuck in my mind that that is the kind of stuff that goes into pepperoni, like the commercial pepperoni you find on a pepperoni pizza. Yeah. And, and what he told me, like this, I, I was just learning. Like I love my patients because they tell me stories of their lives and things that I don't actually have. And he said, you know, if you go to a place like Italy, do you think that pepperoni is wrinkled on the outside? And I said, yeah, it's not very wrinkled. It's kind of smooth. He said, think about American pepperoni. All right. It's super wrinkled. He said, what happens when you take a bath too long? Hmm. Your fingers get wrinkled. Yeah. He's like, that's why. That This is a story you told me. And so it made me really, it kind of like alerted me to the fact that not all processed meats the same. Got to be careful about the choices that you make. Um, you know, and, and we should be more informed. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess uh, I have to check my... I hate this term, but check my privilege to some degree because I shop at some very nice, I'm, I'm very blessed and lucky that I get to shop at some really nice supermarkets where they have meats that are, you know, might be considered by some to be processed, but I know that they're generally very uh, artisanally produced. And every so often when I go into, a, you know, a more standard, typical supermarket, I do glance at the meat section, I see all the different types, the myriad different types of, of ultra processed meat products. Factory farms. Factory farm meat products. And you're hundred percent right that I, the vast majority of them, I wouldn't want in my own body. So you do have to be. It's just being up and being selective. Yeah. You know? I, I agree with that. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, like and we naturally are doing this as a society anyway. I think it's sort of a very modern sensibility. Like think about when, you know, for those of you who eat fish, I like seafood, but if you buy a fish, I think most of us now are um, socially conscious when we buy fish. We don't want to buy fish that's not, we would prefer to buy fish that's sustainably caught. Yeah. Right. And not stuff that's like, you know, stripping the ocean of its resources and damaging, you know, killing sea turtles and, and, and dolphins. And so I think that, you know, it's the same thing. Like be discerning. And the food cultures, certainly in the Mediterranean and Asia, they're very discerning about their food. So when I was on my gap year, you know, one of the things that I took away from that I've always carried with me uh, in my in my own life, and this is long before I studied food as medicine, is that you know I, I went I went to Italy and Greece to study food, culture, and health, and I was interested in understanding how are they connected, how do people talk, you know, how how is it viewed, and and of course people are eating local seasonal, they're preparing with fresh ingredients or whenever they were processing, you know, um, preserving their foods, fermenting, you know, they were using very old traditional artisanal type of techniques, right? So I noticed that right away. All right. But the other thing I noticed is that people were they were eating foods in both Asia and the Mediterranean. What do they do? They actually are very discerning. When you sit down in Italy to eat with a family or friends, what's the first thing? What did we talk about? You talk about the food. Mm. They're talking about the food as they're eating it. It's a very, um, it's a very 
uh, aware, very mindful way of actually eating. So you're you're continuously aware and discerning about your food. In America, I think we've we maybe we never really had this in America, but basically, what do people do? You sit down and you talk about other stuff and you wolf your food down. Yeah, you're not enjoying it. Okay, and as a, as a, and so as a consequence, many people are not as familiar or fluent, even the, even in the lexicon, the the wor- words you use to talk about food. A lot of people aren't that familiar with it, and so one of the things I do in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet. I, in my food chapters, I actually try to write something about the history of the food. I try to write about the description of the taste. You know, I want people to become more comfortable with how to describe the food that they like. I love that. You offer that in your book? Absolutely. That's incredible. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, this is something that I feel so lucky. My my mom raised me with a real appreciation for food. And, uh, and yeah, you want to like, sometimes I have dinner with my friends and they, you know, the way that they describe food, it's like, it's either good, it's either got a lot of flavor or it's not that good, you know, or it's like, uh, bland. it's like, it's a very, this very limited vocabulary right? with which I think Americans in particular use to talk about food. And we need to expand that vocabulary. And, and you know, one of the things that it's not that difficult, honestly, and I, I literally in, in, in the chapters of my book, I literally tried to describe the taste of different types of foods in ways that reflect how somebody who really enjoys food would describe the food. It's not high level hoity-toity stuff. It's actually pretty straightforward, but it's a description. And if you want to also see how other people describe food, you know, in a in with fluency, look at the food channel, look at some of those food competitions and listen to what how the judges mm. describe the food. I mean, it's cool to watch the people racing around the kitchen cooking and preparing. But I, I, one of the things that I love to do is I, I, I love to watch the judges talking about it because they have to describe the flavors. It's probably why those shows are so popular. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's because we, we, I think even the most stoic eater probably watches, you know, we'll put on a show like that. And it just opens up a world of awe and wonder about this, about the seemingly mundane act of eating, which isn't mundane at all. It's incredible. It's amazing. And I'll tell you, really, for your listeners and viewers, one of the things that I encourage people to do here, I have 150 uh, ingredients, foods that actually activate human metabolism, activate your in human studies. And we understand uh, what the substance of it is. And I also put the food dose in there from research studies so you know how much, wow. not just what, but how much. But so then the question is, how do you cook with them? I, I, I do talk a little bit about that, but here's something that I actually write about that I encourage everyone to do. If you see an ingredient, whether it's in my book or somewhere else, it's a healthy ingredient and you're not really sure what to do with it. Now, I know you like to cook. I like to cook. So for us, we could probably wing it and come up with something that's pretty tasty and have a dinner party with it, right? Hmm. But for most people, they're not like that. They, they don't have enough experience. And so the, the idea of food being intimidating, like I might want to try it, but I don't know how to cook that. One of the things that I think is really um, a very modern and, and convenient thing to do, pick the ingredient that you see, um, uh, uh, put recipe in the search bar when you're in your search, and then hit video. Click a video and you will find the search results. You'll come up with dozens of videos of people who really know how to cook that food, that ingredient, that will tell you on YouTube, a streaming video, how to actually cook the food and what it is it taste like. You'll see from soup to nuts how to actually do it. It demyst- It takes all the kind of the mystery out of the intimidation factor out of a food. So like, you know, like for example, I'll give you a you know an example of a of a food that might be um, you know a little mysterious you know like goji berries. All right, all right. Now, you might know how to use goji berries, but I don't know. Maybe somebody doesn't know. Like I don't know what to do with those. All right, go online, hit goji berry recipe video, and watch somebody tell it to you. Wow, I, I mean I just snack on them out of the bag. You can, yeah, absolutely. But I bet you haven't had goji berries steeped in tea with a dried prune and chamomile. Whoa, that sounds okay. amazing. That's actually how they do it in Shanghai. Wow. Right? And so what I'm telling you is that no matter how you do it, like people get bored doing the same thing all the time. Yeah. Right? So I've just told you uh, something that if you go onto YouTube, you'll find somebody to show you exactly how to do it. That's so cool. I was on YouTube the other day Googling how to properly cut flank steak, which is a very tough, typically tough cut of meat. But it's actually very healthful because it's a lean. It's lean. Yeah. It's like a lean. Um, so with the grain or against the grain? 
You go against the grain. Exactly. You go against the grain. Yeah. It cooks better that way too. Does it? Yeah. Interesting. I haven't yet made one, but uh, because I, I, I actually, it's kind of a hard cut to find. Maybe Is because it? it's not in such high demand. I don't know because most mm. people probably don't know how to cut it. But I love this whole message about like bringing greater awareness to food. There was a, a another study that I remember reading a couple couple months back that showed that that found that just doing that. I mean, I know you know calories are sort of like you know we we want to give people practical behavioral modifications and not just talk about you know calories, which so many people do, but that people t- tend to eat less calories when they're just present with their food. Absolutely. And actually, if you eat with other people uh, and you're actually c- talking about the food, you're actually going to be more, much more aware of it. And the speed that you eat also matters a lot. So wolfing your food is stuffing fuel in your body faster than your body can actually process it. And your stomach will signal to your brain, wait a minute, we got food in it. But it takes time for that signal to actually happen. So it's so easy to shovel things down. You know, performers often do this, right? Like professional performers, musicians, you know, like people about to go on stage for a rock show. They, they're like wolfing their food down, you know, at the at the commissary. And, you know, they eat way more at that one sitting than because of the speed they're eating, then their body would naturally, uh, to, so if you eat slowly and mindfully and have situational awareness, and you also listen to your body. You'll find yourself eating a lot less, which by without having to bust out a calculator uh, to figure out, you know, and like scan your food, you'll naturally eat less. Uh, but you know, if you want some practical things, you know, I would also say, you know, when when do you typically overeat? I can tell you when I actually am most vulnerable is at a holiday meal, mm-hmm. right? Go to a Thanksgiving or some other celebration. You know, you know what food's going to be there. Yeah. All right, and you're looking forward to it. And when you enter that house, it smells damn good, right? So you, you just can't wait. And oftentimes, you know, you're like you've been not eating so much during the day, so you can have a big meal. You know, you know the drill. Yeah, you go hungry. Yeah, but the key thing is actually um, it's a, a couple of tips. Um, first, if you um, have smaller plates, research has shown that you'll take smaller portions and you actually eat less food. Wow. Okay, so that's a little trick. You know how? I mean. Who actually mindfully thinks from a health perspective the size of your dinner plate? Okay, but if you serve a smaller plate, you'll take less food, number one. So that's a, that's a little tip. Number two, when you go to a place where there's a bounty of food, including the foods that you love, what I actually do is I encourage people to, to um, first like survey the food, check out what's there, because you're not going to be able to eat it all, all right? Pick the and what I tell tell people to do is you keep your eye on the on the tasty stuff, all right. But actually go for the go for the vegetables, okay. And and take a, a serving first of your vegetables. That way you're not going to forget the plant based foods. It's got the dietary fiber and the polyphenols, um, and usually it's pretty tasty. Like I encourage people in my book to always cook tasty food, always mm. get tea, always eat tasty food. Love your food to love your health is my motto. Okay, so so basically have that there, all right, and then take. The food that you do like, all right, um, but but leave white space on your plate, at any size, all right. When you can see the bottom of the plate, you're not piling on your plate. It's one layer, not multiple layers, all right. And don't go back for seconds. Mm. That way, you're you're kind of, it's a habit, you know. Like if our moms told us this is the right way to actually eat from the time we were like five years old, it's probably how we'd be eating now. Yeah. I had that experience recently. I was at a dinner and uh, somebody brought out like a, it was like a keto paleo, like all the buzzwords. It was like a keto paleo um, pumpkin. It was like an iced pumpkin cake or something like that, which is, was. I remember thinking it was kind of funny because it was, I mean, Halloween is like long behind us, uh, but it was so good. And I had like, it was probably one of the best cakes I've ever had in my life. And I had a slice. And every cell in my body was telling me to go back for seconds. But I was like, Max, <laughs> control yourself. Man up. Man up. <laughs> and I didn't go back for seconds. And I was really freaking proud of myself. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, look, and that is the kind of... I have a sweet tooth. So, I mean, those are those are my weakness. I, can, I don't have to eat French fries. I can avoid French fries. 
but you put like a, and especially you start throwing those buzzwords around. Yeah. Those are very seductive to me. You know, it's keto, it's paleo, grain for all those things. You put it in front of me, I'm like done for typically. This is one of the best cakes I've ever had. And I didn't go back for seconds. You are to be commended for that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> bees pollinate one third of our food supply. Propolis is the bees immune system. It's the protective barrier between them and the outer world. Look for raw honey and do your best to look for a honey that's pesticide free. Backstory, like how do you get into this? Yeah, so growing up, I had chronic tonsillitis. I don't know if you've ever had tonsillitis or maybe strep throat, something like that. It's just viral, painful. And I'm allergic to a few different strains of antibiotics. So it was always really difficult for me to solve this problem. Um, so, you know, and I, I would get it like once a month. It was it was pretty horrible. And I was basically always sick. I had a really weak immune system. I tried everything conventional. I tried everything natural. Nothing worked. I couldn't find a place for myself. And I was just sick a lot. And that was my life. And when I was in college, I did a semester abroad. I was in Europe studying, and when I got really sick, I went to a pharmacy there, and the pharmacist gave me propolis, mm. and I had never heard of propolis before. I knew about honey, but I didn't know the bees did anything beyond honey, and I used it, and it was the first time something worked. In about five days, I made a full recovery, and that was the start of my obsession with bee products. From there, I started incorporating all these different bee products into my routine, doing a ton of research. And then I became so obsessed that when I finished my time abroad and went back to college, I started beekeeping. And that's wow. how I really got into all of this. That's so exciting. Beekeeping, just based on your experience with propolis. Yeah. I mean, I had I, it was really profound for me because I had been sick and tr I felt like I had tried everything. And for me to finally find something and, you know, in a few days make a full recovery and then stop getting sick. I mean, I was in Europe for seven months. And after solving that bound of tonsillitis, I didn't get it again, which was the longest stretch I'd ever gone in my life. And the only new addition was really propolis. And, you know, I started using pollen and some other bee products as well. And I was doing so much research on it. And I realized that, you know, propolis is known for being antiviral, antimicrobial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory. So it makes sense that I had that effect. And I just became really obsessed with it. And then when I went back home, I couldn't really find propolis anywhere. In North America, there's tons of honey, tons of Manuka honey, but it, it propolis just isn't really a household name. And so I was like, you know, I need to get this for myself and I want to learn more. And I've had this really impactful experience. And I was like, I love nature. This could be a cool, weird hobby. <laughs> and it ended up being my life's passion. <laughs> what did your friends and family think when you told them that you were going to become a beekeeper? Oh, they thought I was insane. <laughs> I was also, this is like in 2012, I was in college and, you know, I was like, it's not a normal after school hobby <laughs> for a college kid. Certainly not at that time. So they thought it was pretty weird. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I sort of at that time had a dream of building a company around it and sharing it with the world, but I was graduating with negative funds and I was fortunate to have a good job offer in finance out of school. And I was really encouraged to take that because it sounds insane to start a bee product company. So people thought it was like a cute, quirky hobby I was going to grow out of, I think, at that time. And uh, I ended up going into finance and learned a lot, but you know, my heart is with this. Like I, I don't, I never really cared about being in finance. Um, and so then when I finally left to start this company, once again, I had everyone echo those kind of early <laughs> concerns of like, is this a good decision? <laughs> you should just stay put. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was the best decision I ever made. <laughs> That's amazing. In those early days, were you harvesting all the different bee products from your own bees? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the kind of nice thing I like to share is that long before this was a company, long before I was like trying to sell anything, I was just making these things for myself. Like mm. this is how I solved my health problems. And so it was, there was no pressure. I was just experimenting for me. And so when I was a college student, I was, I started as a beekeeper's apprentice. Literally he taught me everything. And I was really fortunate as well to have a great mentor. Um, his name's John. He was a retired biochemist from Romania who had moved to Canada to like be a recluse and write books. And wow. at the time I was a TA for my chemistry class. So I had this really cool kind of reference point for everything where I was going into the apiary and playing with the bees and harvesting and extracting, doing everything myself. And then I would bring it over to the lab 
and perfect, you know, my version of perfection on like how to extract alcohol properly and like make the certain formula that I just like for myself. So it was a really great time to just be creative. That's super interesting. Were you wearing a beekeeper like costume? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I had a situation one time actually where I was at cheerleading practice and in my bag I had my beekeeper's suit and someone pulled it out because they were just going through my bag to like grab something. And uh, everyone was like, Carly, are you going to murder someone? Like, what? what is happening? Like, it's like a, to them, it looked like a hazmat suit, so. It looks like a fencing costume, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like a full head-to-toe white jumpsuit. Yeah, and then there's like a thing over your, yeah, over your head. Yeah, so you could like either be fencing on the side or you're like a beekeeper, <laughs> which is super interesting. Sydney, my assistant, she she turned me on to this TikTok account of this woman, this this woman who like, is a beekeeper also, but she does it completely without a suit. And mm-hmm. I was like, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Is that, I'm, for, I'm, I'm generally not a fan of insects, mm-hmm. but I, I've warmed up to bees. Yep. People who follow me on Instagram will know that I recently actually tried to save a bee. I found a bee that was hurt and I tried to oh, save it. I didn't know beautiful. what I was doing though. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think I succeeded, but, um, but I think there's a lot of confusion about bees and, Generally, I would say that the sentiment is more of a, of like one of fear. Totally. That bees are just out to hurt us. Is that not necessarily the case? It is totally not the case. Bees are crucial to our life on this planet. So bees pollinate one third of our food supply. Without the bees, we would, I mean, things couldn't grow. A lot of the natural foods that we eat that are so important for our health, we we really would not be able to have access to them. Like it would become a food desert and not to mention these pollinate over 40% of plants and flowers and other creatures rely on them. So if you remove the bees, the entire ecosystem kind of falls apart. Wow. They're critical. Um, And then in terms of the fear, I totally understand bees can sting and a sting will hurt, but bees don't actually want to sting humans. So when a bee stings you, uh, it has these barbed things on its stinger and it, it latches into your skin and it pulls out the bee's abdomen. So the bee will actually die wow. when they sting human skin. They can sting other creatures and survive, but for humans, they weren't really meant to sting us. Interesting. And it's really just something they do when they feel threatened. So I've gone in with my bees wearing like a tank top and jeans. I mean, if I'm like really getting in there, I typically will wear a full suit, but I mean, I've done it in like shorts and a t-shirt and that sort of thing. And if you're really calm, they're like if they don't feel threatened you're really calm you're really gentle you're not that likely to get stung wow Mm -hmm. it's super interesting how many times have you been stung over the course of your life i'm just curious oh my gosh hundreds 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 but like i've i've done dumb things like gone in to the apiary with sunscreen on that was scented that pissed them off and like they're very sensitive to scent Mm. um and i've just i've spent so much time around bees but given how much time I've spent around bees and how much time I've spent about around bees handling things with no protection, no bee suit on, it's actually not that much when you think about it. Wow. It is fascinating, though, what you said about how if you were to take bees off of the planet, that life would, I mean, as we know it, would cease mm-hmm. to exist. Yeah. But if you were to take, I mean, it just got me thinking, if you were to take humans off the planet, Life would flourish. I know, I know. It's so sad. Oh, yeah. Um, but that's really interesting. So, so currently, are bees? What are the primary threats mm-hmm. um, that bees face currently? So, the number one threat, in my opinion, and there's a lot of debate around this because pesticide companies tend to be well funded. Mm. Um, but the number one threat, in my opinion, is pesticides. So, in 2006, DDT was taken out of the game. I, I think. People probably remember the imagery of birds dying and all of that. Silent Spring, Rachel Carson. She mm-hmm. kind of was the original whistleblower. Yeah. And so when they took DDT out, it was replaced with a substance called neonicotinoids. And that is now the most, it's very commonly used in the U.S. Now, other parts of the world don't, they've, they've banned it actually. Parts of um, Europe have banned it. In Canada, they instituted a partial ban in certain provinces. So we know this stuff is bad, but in the U.S., as of now, it's still pretty widely used, and I really hope that changes. And, you know, it's it's not good for us. It's a water-soluble substance. It degrades our soil. But for the bees, it's a neuroactive substance, and it really distorts our spatial reasoning, and it's causing a ton of problems. Um, And so, you know, we've seen a decline in bee populations over the years, and 
pesticides are hugely problematic. And it's really interesting as well because at Beekeepers Naturals, we do pesticide-free beekeeping. Mm. So we make sure that there are no pesticides anywhere near our bees. And we do that for a few reasons. One, for product quality, of course, um, because organic, frankly, just isn't enough when it comes to bees because just because your bees sit on organic land doesn't mean they can't fly next door. And they'll fly for like a five-mile radius. So If they fly next door and the neighbors are doing something dirty, it can get into your end product. So you have to be really careful. So we do natural beekeeping, pesticide free. We're really intense about that. And what we've seen is our hives are flourishing year over year, contrary to population trends. So, I mean, that's not the largest sample and it's not a perfect study, but we're we're literally seeing our bees thrive without pesticides. And we also know, like there was a study that came out from Harvard, we know that these pesticides are harming the bees. So Mm. that's the number one culprit. Um, Other factors, urbanization, climate change. um, You know, a big thing is monocropping. Just the agricultural practices have really changed. So if you think about it, you know, let's like think about it like a monocrop. It's one type of plant and it has one bloom period. So there's a certain time of year where the bees have this awesome buffet. And then after that bloom, it's kind of a desert. Mm. So unless they're planting other, you know, margin planting is a really great practice for people who do have monocrops um, to allow for like a for varied foliage around the perimeter so that bees have different food. And monocropping, just for people who are not super familiar with that term, that's it's a completely unnatural process, right? It's just like human intervention will grow certain crops that are seasonal, yep. and then when they are not in season, that it's just dead. Yeah, it's like I a mean, de- it's like a you know ecological dead it's zone. It's a dead zone. Yeah, I mean, if you think like economically, it makes a lot of sense because we have like our dedicated almond growers and our blueberry growers and people who specialize in these different things, and they can you know maximize the yield. But it's not how things used to be. It's not, you know, varied wildlife and different plant types. And it's just, you know, one organized type of plant. <laughs> hmm. Very interesting. Do bees have any any natural predators other than other than us, perhaps? <laughs> um, wasps will wow. go at bees. Wasps are really scary because they can sting and sting without dying, whereas bees die. So wasps actually give bees a bad rap. But Is there anything good about wasps? Or are they just I mean, they're evil. pollinators too. So oh, they are. I, I've like my I've had my bees terrorized by wasps at times, so I'm not a fan. But like, I appreciate and respect them as pollinators of this planet. <laughs> are you generally cool with like insects? Oh yeah, I'm like a bug girl. You are. That's yeah. so interesting. <laughs> I am very like squeamish when it comes to bugs, especially like, I mean, roaches, water bugs, things like that. I will, I, and I grew up in New York city. Mm -hmm. If there was a water, if I saw a water bug on the sidewalk, I would literally cross to the other side (laughs) of the street. My partner will literally call me into the room to like take a spider outside. (laughs) I don't know. I feel like we have these like innate fears. Some of us, you Mm -hmm. know, um, it's super interesting. So you've brought to the market all these incredible products. And as you mentioned, I think most people are just familiar with like honey. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my favorite bee products and it has been for a long time, is bee pollen. How do you, I mean, like bees, they're, they're, they're just like this untapped reservoir, reservoir of amazing things. Like it started for you with propolis. Mm-hmm. And then like walk me through the process as you, as you began to discover all these other um, products that bees were creating. Yeah. So, I mean, I first fell in love with propolis. And again, like many of us, zero awareness of what the word propolis meant. Like I really just thought that bees make honey. And it's really interesting because bees are actually not native to North America. They were brought over by European settlers. So Mm. in other parts of the world, propolis, royal jelly, pollen, commonly used, commonly used in traditional medicine in certain parts of the world. But in North America, we really only think of bees for honey or depending on what industry you're in, pollination. Um, And so my first experience with propolis, I mean, I was just sick and it was literally the first time something worked. And then... As I started to research it, I found, you know, I just went on PubMed and was like looking up propolis, tons of studies, tons of science. And then it was really interesting because I realized like the first, this isn't new. I was like, what is this new magic I stumbled upon? And of course it is very old. The first recorded human use of propolis dates back to 300 BC. Wow. And, you know, in the 17th century, propolis was listed in the London Pharmacopedia as an official drug. So this is, you know, before 
that this is like what we've been using as medicine for a very, very long time. Um, so propolis was really, you know, the gateway for the, the gateway drug for me. And where do you find, like, how do bees make that? Where is it? How is it harvested? Great question. So everyone thinks that every bee product is a honey derivative. Not at all. So hmm. I'll do a little beehive 101. Yeah, So please. I'll start with honey because we all know it. So honey comes from flowers. Bees will go from flower to flower. They have this long tube-like tongue and they suck up the nectar from the flower, carry it back to the hive in their honey stomach, which is like essentially they have two stomachs. One's for digestion. The other is basically a nectar backpack. Whoa. Um, they bring it back to the hive, put it into, they basically allow it to ferment. It, they get all the water out and it becomes a sticky substance that we know and love as honey. And the bees use that as their food. That's their carbs, their energy source. For humans, it's uh, it's a healthy sweetener. It's full of antioxidants. Um, honey has antiviral effects as well. It actually is a calming effect on the body. A lot of people will take honey before bed. Um, and then it also helps people to sleep through the night because for people, it helps to um, balance the glycogen stores in the liver. So if you're a person who wakes up in the middle of the night, a teaspoon of honey before bed can actually be really supportive. So that's honey. And then propolis, while honey is the bee's food, you can think of propolis as the bee's medicine. Hmm. So honey comes from flowers. Propolis comes from trees or plant and tree resins. So think of like sap as the base ingredient. So the bees will go, they'll collect the sap and the plant and tree resins. And these are the literal immune materials of the plant as well. So you can just kind of see how propolis is more of a medicinal substance than honey. They combine it with their enzymes and they make this sticky amber colored substance called propolis and they use it to line the hive and keep it germ free. So propolis is the bee's immune system. It's the protective barrier between them and the outer world. Um, they'll even line the inside of the cell walls for newborn baby bees to create a sterile environment. And they have a propolis mat at the front of the hive so what? everyone can disinfect. Bees are very smart. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and then propolis, it's like, you know, OG medicine. It's, you know, what you can use to support your overall immune health. Um, it's really something that people can use every day to support their body, protect themselves, um, bolster their natural defenses. It's also really high in antioxidants. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, there's tons of benefits. A lot of people use it for allergies as well because it's so, so potent as an anti-inflammatory substance. Uh, but that's propolis. And now, it, when it comes to propolis, because I know you guys have this, this incredible spray. And side note, I had a I take uh, like regular like voice singing lessons, mm -hmm. and my my teacher shout out to Deborah Joy. She just randomly she didn't know that we were seeing each other later today, but she said that this is a great spray for people who have sore throats. If you're a singer, if mm -hmm. you're a public speaker, so she's a, she was a big fan of this, and I was like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, so my question is, is it you know for best practices like you? use it topically, you spray it on the area? Is it something that you want to ingest and have like, mm -hmm. you know, systemically? I tell people three to five sprays in your mouth every single day. Hmm. If you are doing, I mean, here's the thing we do. I mean, health is <laughs> integral to everything. And there are so many things we do to prioritize it, which is amazing. But if your immune system is not functioning properly, nothing's working. Like you really do want to take the steps to care for your immune system to build up your body naturally. And so three to five sprays of propolis in the mouth every single day, you're, it's like, you know, your bodyguard in a bottle. You're just bolstering your natural defenses. Um, so that's what I do. People who sing use, we have so many singers, podcasters, um, actors, people who use their voice professionally and really rely on it and get the inflammation from working it so much will often take more than that. Hmm. But I, I really believe that everyone should be using propolis every day. I think we can sidestep a lot of different illness and and just really, you know, feel a lot better. Um, it's it's radically changed my immune system. I mean, I haven't had tonsillitis since 2012, wow. which is insane. And I still have my tonsils. And you were struggling with it chronically beforehand. Chronically. I mean, I I missed I would miss like three weeks of school at a time as a kid. Like always sick. Always, always sick. Wow. So interesting. I know. I mean, I love that you found something that works for you. I, when I spray this in the back of my head, it's, it's just so, it's tasty, but it's so soothing as well. I can see how it could definitely be like a, uh, like a life raft after a long day of, you know, vocal performance or speaking mm -hmm. or what have you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like everyday immune health. It's just what you do every day to support your immune system. And I, the bees are onto something. And, it, and again, like 
we found propolis in Egyptian tombs. Like this is not new. Humans have been, it works very well with the human body. Humans have been using it forever. And the base ingredient is the immune components of the plant as well. So it's got, you know, it's like the plant's immune system, the bee's immune system, and it works really well with ours. Wow. So interesting. And there is, I mean, you know, because I've, I've definitely done a, a PubMed search of propolis. There's a good amount of read. There's like, you know, there have been clinical trials, there have been like research reviews. People are definitely within the scientific community talking about this substance, oh, but it's, absolutely. it's probably just not nearly as well funded as, as a pharmaceutical agent. And so you're not going to see the kinds of robust, you know, multi-center trials that, that you're going to see with a, with a, with a drug candidate. But um, totally. that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not doing something. For a natural substance that doesn't have, you know, big pharma mon money funding studies, it actually is a remarkable amount of research. Mm. It was really interesting during COVID we saw a huge spike in interest just for propolis because a lot of um, doctors that have a presence online, a lot of you know health professionals were talking about propolis as an ingredient to support and protect your immune system. Um, so more and more people are starting to understand propolis and search for it and look for it and understand what it is as an ingredient, but we're still really in the early days of sharing it in North America. It's great. Well, Europe is so ahead of the curve in so many ways. Um, that it's just, it's so great that you were able to find it um, and and now make it available to everybody uh, in the way that you have. So we've talked about honey, we've talked about propolis. Royal jelly is something that um, I first heard about when I was a kid, like years ago. And I've never known what it does or, you know, what why people like to use it or I don't even know. Yeah, what is it? What's royal jelly? So royal jelly, so again, honey is the bee's food. Propolis is the bee's medicine. Royal jelly, you can kind of think of as the brain food of the hive. So royal jelly, the nurse bees make it and, you know, a lot of people compare it to like colstrum. So for all newborn baby bees, for the first three days of development, they're given royal jelly. It's like breast milk. Wow. And then after three days, the bees transition off of royal jelly onto a more normal diet, bee diet of honey and pollen. And only the bee who's to become a queen continues with her exclusive royal jelly diet. So that is all the queen is eating. Is that why it's called royal jelly? Yeah, it's the queen's food. It's like bee <laughs> breast milk. Yeah. That bee, bees, bees royal don't... jelly has more of a ring, you know? I was going to ask a really stupid question to be funny, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, so royal jelly. Yeah. So Tell me about jelly. its properties. So, so the, the, it's the exclusive food of the queen bee really interesting because if you just look at the queen bee on a biological level, the queen bee is very, she evolves very differently than regular bees. And, you know, I, I think her royal jelly diet plays a big part in that. So the queen bee is much more robust. If you just Google queen bee versus like regular worker bee, she's, she's jacked, like she's fit. Wow. And um, the queen bee will lay around 1500 babies a day, whereas regular female worker bees don't have reproductive organs. The queen bee will live three to five years. Whereas a regular worker bee during foraging season lives six to eight weeks. They literally work their ass off until so they worker, die. <laughs> worker bees don't reproduce. No, they don't. It's the, the queen, queen bee who makes does them it all. all. Wow, yep. that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And also what I've learned is that worker bees are primarily, they're all, they're all, all for all the most women. part female. All women. The women well, do everything in the hive. See, bees also, they have this, uh, this beautiful women's empowerment story to them as well because they're doing so many good things for the world and they're, they're mostly women. Yeah. The, the male bees, they're called drones. Women. They're... I could probably get in trouble for that. Uh, <laughs> not that I care, but we'll, we'll say that they're female. <laughs> yeah. More, but um, the accurate. male bees are called drones and their sole purpose in life is reproduction. Hmm. Like they basically mate with the queen. They die during this process. The queen will take her like mating flight, have sex in the air with a drone and he dies. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Goes out good. Goes out strong. Um. And then once the queen has, basically once she's pregnant and when it's sort of like approaching fall, the male bees are all kicked out of the hive. They're, the girls are like, hey, you guys are a drain on resources. You're going to need to go. And it, they just, you know, overwinter like that. So the, bee, the male bees don't do much. I had no idea the bees were such feminists. <laughs> they are. I love it. I love it. Hey, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, sometimes I see huge bees flying around. Mm -hmm. Are those? Those are bumblebees. Those are probably. Oh, so the, there's a difference between the worker bees, between a worker bee and a bumblebee. So there's a 
bunch of different bee species. So honeybees are the ones that we work with at Beekeepers Naturals. Honeybees are the ones that you know are making the honey. Um, they're the most effective pollinator, but there are tons of different bee species that are great pollinators too. So the big fuzzy ones, those are bumblebees. Yeah, they're slow and cumbersome. Mm-hmm. and They're really cute. <laughs> they're, they terrify me. <laughs> they terrify me. Glad you find them cute. Um, so those are bumblebees. Those are bumblebees, yeah. So yeah, there's a bunch of different types of bees. Um, bumblebees are, I, so generally speaking, like solitary bees. Bumblebees are actually social as well, but solitary bees, there's some bee species that really live on their own. They don't live in like a hive community. And they're really unlikely to sting you. There are even stingless bees. Like there's tons of different types of bees all over the world. So yeah, honeybees though, they are the world's most effective pollinators. Hmm. So they're, again, all bees are super amazing at pollination, but honeybees are just like efficient. Wow. So we've talked about propolis. Mm -hmm. We've talked about honey. I should tell you what royal jelly does for humans though, because it's amazing for bees, but it has some really cool properties that affect humans and specifically affect the brain. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned that it was like a brain food. So what does it do to the human? Yeah. So royal jelly is really well known for focus memory concentration. Hmm. It contains acetylcholine. It's one of the only naturally occurring sources. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter basically responsible for brain-body connection. It helps to speed up your transmission system. And then this is like a really cool thing that I like to nerd out on. Royal jelly contains these two fatty acids called 10-HDA and AMPN1 oxide. And these basically promote BDNF. They act as a catalyst for neurogenesis. So they're really, I mean, a lot of people, I see a lot of people using royal jelly after a concussion um, or, you know, with any sort of brain trauma, I use Royal jelly on a daily basis. I just take, we have these like be smart brain shots that I think you've tried. Um, I take those every day and that's just what I do for focus memory concentration. I also try to stay off caffeine and Royal jelly gives you like a nice little energy boost. Um, but Royal jelly is really powerful for pretty much supporting your executive functioning. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. The Belixir like capsules that you guys make. Mm-hmm. Um, very interesting. I know there's a lot of people interested in nootropic. Would you, would you consider it a nootropic Absolutely. substance? Absolutely. Yeah. Our B-Smart shots are definitely nootropics. And so we have the Royal Jelly in there and then we have Ginkgo Biloba, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners know about. And then Bacopa Monnieri, which is, it's also an adaptogen. It's um, an extract from a leaf traditionally used in Ayurvedic medicine that has great properties for the brain as well. Amazing. So bee pollen, where does bee pollen fit into yeah, all this? Yeah, pollen is also one of my favorites. And I'm really sorry because I brought you bee pollen and left it in my Uber, but I'm going to get you more. <laughs> bee pollen is actually like my, of, of all of them, I would say probably my favorite. I eat this stuff by the, by the fistful. I mean, it's so good for you. Well, before even you got started with Beekeepers Naturals, I was a huge fan of it. It's so good. It's like, how would you describe the taste? It's like fruity, yeah, I mean, it depends on the time of year it's harvested and the floral sources. I'm like so good with my bee pollen now that I kind of know what flowers it's coming from. Not always, but sometimes. Um, but bee pollen, you can really think of it. So for the bees, carrying on with our theme here, for the bees, it's their protein source. Hmm. So literally the bees will go flower to flower, collect the pollen. They mix it with their enzymes. So they kind of like bunch it up. And then they stick it on their hind legs and it's called their pollen pants. So like (laughs) if you see a picture of a bee with these like yellow balls on their hind legs, that's their pollen pants and they're carrying it back to the hive like that. Wow. Yeah. And then it's the bee's protein. So that's what bee pollen is. It's literally the protein source for the bees. The bees eat it. And for humans, I like to think of bee pollen as nature's multivitamin. It is just one of the most nourishing um, substances. It's full of broad spectrum of vitamins, minerals. Um, you know, it's actually got more protein per weight than any animal source that's per weight. So it's hmm. not that heavy, but um, it's a really complete food. And so it's something that I take every single day and I do it for energy boosting, but I really just do it to cover my bases nutritionally because it's so bioavailable and it's so, it's like, it's just such a potent source of vitamins and minerals. And it's an actual food. I mean, it's not a supplement next Mm -hmm. to honey. It's like the other food that is produced by bees. How do you integrate bee pollen into your, like into your diet? Do you do do it it, like me? Like you're just shoveling into your mouth or. So after I work out, um, it depends what I've done. Actually, if I'm going to do something that's really intense cardio, I'll take it before because it actually increases your endurance. I'll just like have a spoon of it or like throw back a pollen shot. Um, I sometimes take it after I work out just for recovery. 
Um, but I'll put it on my smoothie. I, I put bee pollen on like everything. I sprinkle it on my avocado toast. Anything that you would put like chia seeds or hemp seeds or cacao nibs, anything like that on, I, I use bee pollen. I even put it on ice cream. I'll like make an ice cream sundae and sprinkle bee pollen on top of it. That sounds fire. I mean, I put it on the, the ice creams that I make in my Vitamix. Like I'll just mm-hmm. like blend up some frozen berries and whey protein, uh, which by the way, for any of you guys listening, you can make a really simple ice cream doing this. You just get frozen berries. I like to get a mixed bag of organic berries from like sprouts or whatever. And you throw like a little bit of almond milk unsweetened and then two scoops of protein powder. You blend it up and you mash it down with a tamper and you get this ice cream. And then after that, I love to sprinkle some bee pollen on top. It's so good. That sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, it's tasty. That's Th- the thing, though, that I love about all bee products from propolis to pollen to you name it. They're almost like, they're like food grade. You know, they're very bioavailable because I have I have such an issue with, you know, not all supplements are taken in by the body the way we want them to be. A lot of things we we just don't really break down and we titrate and pee out, you know, the $40 supplement we're spending money on. And so B products, they're really well integrated by your system. Couldn't agree more. Sometimes I get bee pollen that's uh, really soft and mm-hmm. then other times I get it and it's really firm. Is there a difference in the chemical constituents that account for that that variation? So there's a few things that could be making a difference. One is the floral type it's coming from. Um, there's just, you know, natural variants in the type of pollen. But the other thing is a lot of pollen and all pollen's great. So, you know, just take your pollen, everyone. But um, unless you have very severe allergies in that case, I would be careful because it's pollen from the plant. So, right. you know, um, a lot of pollen is dried. Hmm. So people will harvest it, they'll apply a lot of heat, they'll dry it out, um, and then they sell it and it can be a little bit crunchier. So something that we do is all of our pollen's raw and you know even dried pollen is incredibly nutritionally dense, but I like to keep ours raw because pollen has, like all bee products, really powerful enzymes, like how the bee is collecting the pollen and how they're bunching it together and transferring it, otherwise it would be a powder, is by mixing it with their enzymes. And bee enzymes are magic. So for our, for the pollen at Beekeepers Naturals, it's completely raw. Um, and that's why we recommend like once you open it, it's totally fine before you open it. And if you've opened it already, it's not bad. It's just ideal to keep in the fridge or freezer after you've opened it. Now, when I travel, like I did a road trip this summer, my pollen was sitting in a hot car and I ate it every day. It gets really hot in the hive. So it's not like your pollen's going to go bad, but it is great to preserve the enzymes that way. But sometimes the harder pollen is because they've applied a lot, a lot of heat and dried it out. Interesting, but it doesn't degrade the the healthy health qualities of I it. I mean, it will degrade the enzymes for sure. Mm. Anytime you're applying a high heat like that, and like heat as in, so sometimes the reason people will apply heat to pollen sometimes is to clean it. Mm. Um, for like, us, is that like pasteurization or? Sort of. You can think of it that way just because little things like you know, sticks, leaves, when you harvest pollen, there's stuff that gets into it. Like how you harvest pollen is you put this basket kind of under an area of the hive and the pollen that the bees basically drop, we collect into that. And so there's, you know, people have different methods, but that's what we do. But with that, you know, you get leaves, you'll get like twigs, that sort of thing. And so some people will use a really high heat to clean it. What we do is we use air. So we we, we basically have this huge machine where we like fan it and so we basically blow out and we have it's sort of like a mesh catcher we blow out anything that's bigger than the pollen granules that's so cool it's definitely one of those things like i i have to have it in my fridge and uh on on greek yogurt i'll put it in um it's even good on salads like in salad mm-hmm. dressing it's, it's got a really strong flavor yeah. so i don't use a lot in salads but um but definitely people should check it out it feels decadent too i mean i just like yeah, I, I go to town. It's on that so stuff. funny. I when I first started beekeeping, the first time I tried pollen, I was like, "No, this is like way too earthy for me. I don't like this taste." And now my body craves it. Yeah, I love like it all the time. It's awesome. Um, I want to go back to honey a little bit because it's it's obviously the most common of the products produced by bees, and there are a bunch of different kinds of honey on the market. Um, so maybe you can help us make sense of all that, mm-hmm. right? Like you mentioned, I think earlier, manuka. Yeah. What what are the different honey types and what should people be looking for? Yeah. So Manuka honey, it's a specific type of honey that comes from the Manuka plant. It's native to New Zealand. The Manuka plant's really similar to eucalyptus. So you can, eucalyptus honey would have similar properties. So Manuka honey doesn't come from a sp- specific type of bee. No, it's a specific type of plant. Got it. But Manuka got really famous because New Zealand ran studies on it. And they, ran, they found that 
Manuka has antiviral capabilities. Now, Manuka is really expensive. And I think that our local honey would have those same antiviral capabilities, but we just haven't done the same studies. Mm. Um, and I, we know for sure that propolis is a stronger antiviral source than any honey. Like there's no honey that's going to be as a lot of raw honeys have traces of propolis in them and that's part of their magic. But propolis specifically, like that's really what you want for immune driven things. And it's going to be much more potent than honey. Um, but as you said, there's a lot of different honey varietals. So when you're looking for honey, so Manuka is great, but do you need to spend a crazy amount of money for like the name Manuka? No, like any raw, good quality honey is going to get you there. Now, a study was done and it found that the darker the honey, the higher the antioxidant. So buckwheat honey, which is a specific, it comes from the buckwheat plant. Um, that one has a very earthy flavor. It's not like the sort of like light, sweet honey, but it's also got a dark, rich color, kind of molasses looking. Mm. That has the highest antioxidants. And really interesting, there was a study that was looking at buckwheat honey compared to a substance called dextromethorphan. And dextro is like, it's the active ingredient in most cough syrup. So like Robitussin, whatever you would buy at CVS, the traditional cough syrup, typically has dextro in it. And the study was done comparing buckwheat honey to dextro, and it was looking specifically at upper pediatric respiratory infections, so kids with respiratory infections. Wow. And it found that buckwheat honey was just as effective. Wow. And so when that study came out, I was like, oh my gosh, why would you give a kid or adult dextro and like the sugar cough syrups when buckwheat honey is literally just as effective? So that's why we made our cough syrup. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so the darker the honey yeah. generally... Darker, the more, antioxidants. the more antioxidants. The key things to look for raw, because if you're buying pasteurized honey, and pasteurized honey just means it's been heated um, to a really high degree. It's like the type of honey that typically comes out of that squeezy bear mm -hmm. is pasteurized. If it's really liquidy, it's probably been pasteurized unless it was like just harvested. And so you you do not want that because that's sugar water. Hmm. Pasteurized honey, you've cooked all the nutrients out, you've applied a really high heat. So, you know, you're losing all those antioxidants and all the nutritional properties. So the raw honey is what you want. So always make sure you have that. Now, raw honey will solidify. So sometimes I have people say like, oh, my honey went bad. And I'm like, well, that's impossible because honey is the only food on the planet that never expires. Like they've found honey in Egyptian tombs that's like totally nutritionally intact. And that's a testament to bees enzymes. It's wow. pretty cool. So yeah, your honey, like it never expires. That's Not so interesting. Possible. Yeah. So if your honey's getting hard, um, it's just crystallizing, which is a natural process. And that's why people pasteurize honey to avoid crystallization because it's more user-friendly, squeezes hmm. out of a tube. Um, if it pasteurizes, it's harder. You have to kind of heat it up a little bit to soften it. Um, so yeah, but crystallization is a totally natural process. If your honey crystallizes, that's fine. Still eat it. If you want it to be softer, what you can do is heat up some water stick the jar of honey into the boiling water. You're not going to pasteurize <laughs> it doing that. You have to work at it to pasteurize it. Um, and that's how you can soften it. But the key thing is look for raw honey and do your best to look for a honey that's pesticide free. And organic, what we were talking about earlier, organic does not necessarily mean pesticide free, unfortunately. Um, that's a big misconception that yeah. I think needs to be dispelled. However, organic does indicate typically that there's a... a Lower. There's no, well, there's no, there's also, they don't use legally, they can't use synthetic pesticides, but, mm. but organic, they still have organic approved pesticides, Totally. but I would feel a lot safer. Um, I know that there's like, people are listening and be like nature fallacy, you know, like natural doesn't necessarily mean safer, but mm. when it comes to herbicides, pesticides and things like that, you know, they're using, they use like vitamin D as a, as a natural, um, pesticide an organic approved pesticide. Totally. So I wasn't even, t for, first of all, organic is, you know, definitely safer. And for me with my produce, I make a real concerted effort to purchase organic produce because I just don't want to, the synthetic pesticides, I just don't want to support that generally. Mm -hmm. um, but with bee products, even organic, organic pesticides, it doesn't necessarily mean pesticide free. Because remember, the bees will forage for a five mile radius. So that's why like at beekeepers, our apiaries are in the middle of nowhere. We do a ton of work in Canada because it's a massive landmass with a tiny population. So like we have bees in the Rockies, like we, our bees are really in the middle of nowhere. And there are definitely places in the U.S. where you can get pesticide free and where 
you know, or the organic pesticides aren't surrounded by like the gross pesticides, but it's getting harder and harder in the U S. Wow. What about, um, the packaging? Does that matter? Because when you were talking about the plastic bear bottle with the honey, I was thinking, okay, they're pasteurizing this honey, they're heating it up and then they're putting it probably straight afterwards into this plastic container that, you know, hot liquid plastic container. To me, that's a recipe for exposure to plasticizing compounds. Yeah. I mean, I'm big on anything that's super hot. I don't want it near plastic. Yeah. I haven't seen any research specifically on that relating to honey, but you know, I've seen, we, we know that hot plastic is a bad situation. Now we have never, pa first of all, we don't pasteurize honey at all at my company. I've actually, n no, I think one time when I was an apprentice, I pasteurized honey for someone, <laughs> but I've never pasteurized honey. I mean, I haven't in a long time and I've certainly never pasteurized it and poured it into anything but glass. So I've never even experimented with that, but I would, I mean, I would just avoid the squeezy bear honey <laughs> if it's pasteurized. Like if you, if you are having honey that's pasteurized and you think you're getting any health benefits, you're not at sugar water. Yeah. Super interesting. Speaking of the carbs and honey, do you, is it's primarily fructose, right? Have you mm -hmm. done like a yeah. And so it also, it's also really interesting. People think that all bee products are high sugar and like, yes, of course, honey has sugar in it. It doesn't spike you in the same way that, you know, regular sugar would or certain types of sweeteners do. Um, but propolis and our bee smart as well, those are sugar free. Those, I mean, first of all, there's no added sugar, but there's zero, there's no added sugar in any of our products, but there's zero grams of sugar. So we have people who are in ketosis who use propolis and be smart all the time. I tell those people like, you know, pollen might kick you out, honey will kick you out, but go for it with the be immune propolis spray and the be smart shots. It's, I mean, it really, all, the dose ultimately is what determines whether or not something is keto or not. There's like yeah. this dogma in the keto space, you know, I mean, like a teaspoon of sugar can be keto. Yeah. A, you know, a cup of white rice can be keto if you're exercising vigorously. You know, I mean, it's like they're, yes, they're carbs. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, they're sort of counterproductive to ketone generation, uh, ketone production. But if, you know, if that's all you're consuming in a day, are you going to be kicked out of ketosis for any significant duration? No. So when people get that obsessive, I think it's, it can be counterproductive and a little obsessive. Totally agree. And such a big thing is like using honey, even people who are in ketosis, like using honey for sleep, a little bit of honey. If you're not having good sleep, I know. then what are you doing? You're opening the door to so many different health problems. Yeah. So interesting. So what's next for, for Beekeepers Naturals? I mean, you guys have all these incredible products. You're at every major supermarket that I've you know seen. I always look out for you guys. Um, what's, uh, what's on the horizon for you? What are you excited yeah. about? So, I mean, I'm really excited about a product that we just came out with. It's I don't know if you've ever taken Halls or Ricola before, but we just came out with lozenges. Amazing. That are really, really clean. I'll give you some to try. Um, I think I think you have some actually, but I'm really excited about those. They've got zinc, vitamin D, propolis, and just a really clean ingredient profile. Um, a gram of sugar per lozenge, eight calories per lozenge. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at lozenges. I'm so, I like nerd out so hard on this because it literally took me like three years to make these lozenges because every hard candy manufacturer I went to was like, we need to use cane sugar as a binding agent or maltodextrin or aspartame. And I was like, well, we don't work with those ingredients. So <laughs> no, um, but that's a product that we just launched. And then beyond that, we're really looking to reinvent the medicine cabinet and, you know, clean up the medicine cabinet, things like our cough syrup, and then also just share the, the different powerful nutritive foods from the beehive and really make them mainstream. Like, again, these are tools that everyone should be using. They're tools that humans have had in the toolkit for thousands of years. And we just really want to bring it, bring it back and bring it forward and give people a modern way to incorporate bee products into their life and have, you know, the best experience they can. I love it. How can people support bees? Great question. So big thing is pesticides really get to know what's happening on your lawn. I know a lot of people, I was talking to someone the other day in LA who was a gardener um, and they were telling me it's organic. And then they had this conversation with their gardener and there's a lot of pesticides being used. So check out what's happening on your lawn, go pesticide free. Um, a great thing to do to support bees. And, you know, I do this in New York on my balcony, um, have a 
just plant some local flowers, like mm. any kind of bright colored flowers, make sure they're pesticide free. One of the things affect, well, one of the things affecting bees is pesticides, of course, but the other is urbanization. There's not plentiful food for the bees. So if you can create a little bee habitat just by planting some organic flowers, great. Um, another thing is do your best to support small scale biodynamic pesticide free growers, because again, these are people who are creating food for the bees. Um, and then we do a ton of stuff through the company. So we make these, we make like all of our swag. We give 100% of proceeds to our charity partners. We work really closely with UC Davis Bee Research. They're an unbelievable research institution. Check them out. You can also donate directly to them through beekeepers. Um, but they're doing all kinds of research just on how we can better support the bees and learn more about the integral roles bees, bees play. Um, and bee products. Do they do any research on the bee products themselves? They do. Yeah, they do. A lot of recently they're really focused on just because of the bee decline, how yeah. we can support bees overall. But we've we've done all kinds of stuff with them. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I feel like people are going to be, you know, a little bit trepidatious. Like they want us, they're, they're going to, you know, want to plant flowers on their balconies or whatever. But they're then scared they're, of bees coming. But then they're going <laughs> to have more bees around. So... So here's the thing, unless you're really getting in the bee's face, swatting at it, it's unlikely that it stings you. Mm. I mean, again, like I'm going, I've like gone into the hive, like put my hand inside their house, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that, that will be kind of in their face. But if you're outside in the garden, there's a few bees flying around, unless you're like really swatting at them or, you know, wearing a ton of perfume or something that's really triggering, they're not going to come after you. Um, you know, they'll probably just help your flowers grow really beautifully. <laughs> yeah. I think people these days have a, they have an affinity for bees. I, f I feel like there's been really great, um, this, this incredible shift over the past couple of decades. You know, I mean, people are still afraid of spiders. People are mm -hmm. definitely still afraid of like roaches and pests and things like that. Yeah. But bees, there is this sort of really benevolent, um, I think, uh, morale that people have about, about bees. Well, yeah, I think people are starting to understand that if we lose the bees, we are destroying the environment. Like we really do need the bees and especially with the decline. I mean, can you imagine a world? Well, first of all, like the inflation on natural food. If we can't, things, everything's bee pollinated, almonds, apples, avocados, blueberries. If we can't use bees to pollinate, like what are we going to do? Humans are going to hand pollinate with Q-tips. A blueberry would cost like 50 bucks, you know? Oh my God, yeah. So it's really important just to preserve our food system, our natural food supply, the fruits and vegetables that we support the bees. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're gonna love this one. After seeing multiple specialists and finally getting somebody to perform some testing, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, and I did what the doctors told me. I took all of the medications. I was on 100 milligrams of prednisone steroids and I was in and out of the hospital constantly. I had multiple blood transfusions, um, was constantly needing iron infusions. I mean, just the, the gamut. Uh, nearly lost my life a couple of times in those earlier days, just not understanding how severe the disease was and letting it get so far that I was just very, very, very morbidly anemic and lost, you know, so much weight. Um, and so after a few years of that and being young and not feeling like I was living the vibrant, you know, 20 something life that I wanted and newlywed life as well, I started just kind of trying to research on my own. Uh, I asked a lot of doctors, every doctor I saw, I asked if food could help. Um, ulcerative colitis is in your colon. So even though I didn't study nutrition or medicine in college, there was still something in my brain that was like, well, everything that I eat is going through there. So, you know, is there something maybe that could be making it worse um, or something that I'm not getting enough of? Uh, and they all told me that diet wouldn't cause cure or help it. Mm. And um, so it was it was a lot of years of just taking that, you know, you're, you kind of just trust what your doctors say. And um, it was a lot of years of feeling pretty, pretty hopeless. And then I stumbled upon a few things online. Um, I would, one of the medications I was on would cause me not to sleep at all for, you know, eight, eight hours a night. I would just be wide awake. 
And so I would spend a lot of time on the internet. <laughs> and 2007, there wasn't, you know, social media wasn't really around. Facebook was new. It was mostly like medical chat boards, some blogs here and there, but not a lot. And um, I found just some people that were using diet to help their inflammation levels and to help their various autoimmune diseases. Um, but specifically ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and cutting out grains and dairy. Uh, and it was just kind of this glimmer of hope that there might be an alternative way. And that was really kind of what started me on the path to continuing to just read and research about it and then eventually try, you know, multiple different types of diets and lifestyles for myself until I found one that really helped to improve my symptoms. Wow, what a what an incredible story. For listeners who are <laughs> who are unfamiliar with autoimmunity, I mean just at a 30,000 foot level, like what is yeah, what is autoimmunity? Yeah. Yeah, the way I like to describe it, and again, I'm like, I'm not a doctor or scientist, but I've been living with this for 12 years um, or 13 years. Autoimmune diseases are when your immune system is overactive and they attack an otherwise healthy organ that doesn't need to be attacked. <laughs> it's kind of the way that I'm like, that's the easiest way to explain it to me. So for me, it's my colon, the white blood cells in there that are causing inflammation and it's trying to fight something off that's not present. Um, people can have you know, psoriasis and it can attack their skin, um, MS. Uh, I mean, there's just, there's I think 180, 200 or so known autoimmune diseases. Then there's things like lupus that actually can affect your entire body. Um, but essentially that's, that's the way that I've come to understand it. Wow, it's amazing that you, as you mentioned, you you know, you visited all these doctors, and they gave to you basically what I've come to call diagnose and adios. You know, they were just like, yeah. hey, take these drugs. There's this there's this incredible meme. I don't know if you're if you've seen it uh, circulating on social media, but it's like there's a woman sitting on the I don't know what it's called, but like the bench in the in the in the in the doctor's office, and she looks really unhappy, and she's got like you know spots all over her face. And she just, she clearly, like the cartoonist drew her to depict how miserable she was feeling. And the do, and the quote underneath, right. there's a doctor looking at her. And the doctor's like, well, are, all your labs look normal. Looks like you're right. okay. You know? Right. But, I mean, so often there are these, these underlying latent conditions going on. And it really takes doing, becoming your own health investigator like what you've done yeah. to get yeah. to the root cause. So I just want to, right. like, applaud you in your journey. <laughs> well, thank you. It's uh, when you feel that helpless and hopeless at that point, I think a lot of times it is hard for people to want to push through because it's just so much to think about and you don't know the right questions to ask and you don't know the right tests to request, you know, and that's like something that you hope and expect your doctor to guide you towards. Um, and I definitely had those frustrating. I mean, it took, you know, multiple specialists to finally even get tests and then to be diagnosed. And then even after diagnosis, yeah, I mean, I was sent out the door after a week long hospital stay of this is what you have. It's uncurable. You'll have it for life, but just take this. And that was kind of it. They never actually even told me about autoimmunity. They didn't mention those, like that it was an autoimmune disease. They just, you know, kind of sent me out and then we asked why and you know how, and that was just kind of like, well, we don't really know, you know, and that was pretty much all the answers we got. So I had to, I had to take it into my own hands. It's also just the kind of person I am. <laughs> um, but I just had to keep searching and researching and trying to learn about it on my own. I love that. I can, I can totally relate. So you mentioned that you were, you know, you started scouring these online message boards back in 2007 and you stumbled upon this like grain free, dairy free <laughs> lifestyle. When you first saw, yeah. you know, that mentioned, I mean, like what was, what was going through your head? Because grains and I, and I, cause I, you know, like growing up in the eighties and nineties, grains were, I thought were this amazing thing that you've got to eat seven times a day. Right. Right. Like, right. So, so like what yeah, was your, definitely what, what we were taught. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know what, to be quite honest with you, I remember being like, I don't even know what a grain is. Yes. Like I always heard whole grain is most, you know, it's the healthiest and you're supposed to eat it all the time. And we got rid of like the wonder bread and started eating whole grain bread and that type of thing. But if, if you could have asked me to list the actual foods that were grains, I w had no idea. So it was a massive learning curve for me. Um, so I think when I first said, like saw it, it probably didn't hit me just how much stuff I was going to have to cut out. Um, it was more of just like, okay, well, this is working. Let's try to give it a shot. But when I really started flipping the ingredient list and looking and like, oh, wow, everything that I'm eating has, you know, grains in it or dairy or soy or corn or, you know, things like that. That was really <laughs> the, the kind of eye opening moment of like, okay, there's a lot we have to change here. And there's a lot I have to, you know, go through and just completely like revamp my kitchen, revamp my pantry. And then on the other side of things, 
I didn't know how to cook, you know, any other way. I mean, I was pretty young as it was and didn't do a whole lot of cooking in college, but anything I did know how to make came from my mom, my grandma, and, and it all used grains. So it was, uh, it was, it was a fairly big shift and it, it took me a long time. I might always like to say that because I think, it's a mental thing for people, you know, I mean, you're grieving your diagnosis and you're grieving all of these foods. And then you're just in this kind of deer in headlights kind of time for a little while where you're just like, I don't even know what to do. It's just so much. And then there's this commitment that you have to make, you know, and, and that was mentally really hard for me. I'd commit and then I'd fall off and I'd go back and, you know, and I wouldn't see the improvement that I wanted at first, but that's because Maybe I was doing five days of doing well, but then I'd, you know, go and eat whatever I wanted on the weekends. And so my body just wasn't even having time to recover. So it was a good few years before I really set, you know, my mind to it and was like, no going back. This is it. This is the only way that I can live a, a full and happy life. Did you, uh, was there any point at which you grieved grains? Oh, yeah. I mean, I loved, I mean, grains, dairy, all of it. Yeah, I loved a baguette with cheese. Like I loved a good bowl of oatmeal in the morning. So yeah, there was a long period of time. I'm also like, I'm kind of, I'm known now for my baked goods. <laughs> um, and it's just, I grieved the celebratory things like, you know, getting to throw a party for family and friends and having a cake or a pie or something like that. Or, um, I mean, it had been another wave when I had started having kids, I have three kids and I, you know, went through this kind of wave at the beginning of my first son, he's 10 now, but just this feeling of like, Oh, like moms are supposed to be able to make cookies with their kids and <laughs> sit and enjoy them. Or like there's a birthday party at school and I really want him to not feel left out. And so there were, there were multiple kind of times where I grieved the foods that I couldn't have. And that's really what set me on the path of starting to create my own recipes because I just was like, I refuse to be this young and live the rest of my life feeling like I'm missing out on all of the things that are important to me and the traditions and, and the like nostalgic times that I remember as a child. Yeah. I mean, looking over your Instagram, it doesn't look like you're missing out on anything. It's just, so, <laughs> it's just so funny. Like I, you know, growing up, like every meal had to have a grain for me, you know, right, like it was either right. like a sandwich or a wrap or a brown rice bowl or whole wheat pasta. I remember being right, such a huge yeah. I couldn't I couldn't envision life without grains. But now it's funny, like not only do I never think about grains, I can't really envision life with them, or at least with them taking up the kind of real estate on my plate that they used to yes. take up. That's what I was gonna say. They definitely took up. I mean, when you, I was gonna say the same word with real estate. It's like that's I feel like that was the majority of what filled us up as kids. It was like a teeny portion of vegetables, if any, a little bit of meat and then whatever it was, that big starch, you know, on the side. And I always say, you know, I when I first started eating this way, paleo was very big. And that's the word that was used a lot just because it classified my recipes. And there was this, you know, kind of character at the time going around with like a person just eating this like massive turkey leg. And that's kind of what people thought that it was just all meat heavy all the time. And I always said, I, I'm, I eat more vegetables now than I did before because there's more space on my plate that I can fill. And I also realized just how nutrient dense and healthy they are and how great they are for my body. But I'm like cutting out the grains didn't mean for me adding, you know, more meat necessarily or other things to fill that in. It was like, Oh wow, I actually have expanded my view to eating and filling up more on on vegetables yeah love that speaking of vegetables so in your own personal health journey you know there's a lot of talk these days about lectins you know inducing what's called molecular mimicry aggravating people's immune systems when they have yeah. active, active autoimmunity so have you found that there are any vegetables that that you you know seem to do better you know without or um like what's your current diet look like these days <laughs> So the only thing that I found, and it just depends if I'm symptomatic, which this has not been a perfect journey. I actually had a really bad setback last year, um, but I've done incredibly well considering and compared to what I used to be. But um, when I'm symptomatic, vegetables are hard if they're not cooked. And that's mm. pretty that's pretty standard for anybody with a digestive disease, um, especially things like leafy greens and things like that. But otherwise, the only one that I don't do a lot of or I don't really do at all are white potatoes. Um, and it kind of depends. I can do some nightshades, you know, if they're cooked, I don't do a ton of tomatoes. Um, but the lectin thing I think is interesting. Um, I've been really trying to study and learn kind of over the last couple of years. It's fairly new, all things considered with my full journey from 2007. 
Um, but I haven't found it to be super detrimental for me just in terms of like the seeds in a cucumber or things like that. Um, but I do think there's something to it. And I think, you know, everything, everybody's bodies are different. That's what I found. I'm like, I think there's this kind of good baseline, but then there might be nuanced things here and there, but yeah, really just raw stuff when I'm not feeling well. And then white potatoes just don't do well for me. They can cause inflammation and I get bloated and my joints can hurt and I just kind of stay away from them. Oh man. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, I don't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want it to sound like I was endorsing like removing lectins or anything like that, but yeah. it's just, it's just been interesting because a lot of people today, you know, whether it's, you know, sort of a, a more, well, I guess like Gundry-esque approach, you know, who have cut the lectins right. out or yeah. have gone full-blown carnivore. It just seems that, you know, mm -hmm. some people with active autoimmunity, like it's not just the removal of grains that bring on a reprieve right. of symptoms. It's a more extreme version of that. So I was just wondering if you sort yeah. of dabbled in, in any of those more extreme uh, <sighs> dietary pa patterns. No, I haven't, um, aside from, from paleo or occasionally I kind of revert to like an autoimmune protocol when I'm not feeling well, which cuts out the nuts, the seeds, the nightshades. So that definitely is a little bit more extreme. Um, but I found that I don't have to do that all the time, which I'm grateful for. Um, it's really just in order to kind of get symptoms at bay, but really for me, it's grain and dairy free, no refined sugars, uh, no legumes. Um, but in, a, in addition to that, I found and really learned the hard way over the last few years that I actually really have to take care of my body as a whole. I have to make sure that I'm prioritizing rest. I have to make sure I'm prioritizing not being stressed and anxiety and all of those things. And they really kind of go hand in hand with the way that I eat. Stress is massive. Stre I mean, a, a stressful event can cause a flare up, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I knew that, <laughs> but I didn't really take it seriously. And um, that's what put me into such a bad setback last year. I just didn't have the boundaries that I needed to and ran myself into the ground no matter how well I was eating. So I've learned, I've learned my lesson, but I'm sure I'll probably, you know, stumble again at some point. <laughs> Man, well, well, glad you're on the mend. So how did you then come to start your blog against all green? Yeah, so I started my blog in... 2009, I believe. I might have started in 2008, but I kind of just I didn't really touch on it. I was starting to get into the kitchen and create recipes. Again, it was like there might have been one or two blogs at that point. There, I don't think, were any cookbooks, uh, maybe very shortly thereafter. Uh, and so I just felt at a loss. I felt like the food I was eating was cardboard, and I just felt very deprived and was like, is not the life I want. I grew up in a very large Italian family that hosted big, my, my grandmother still to this day, 80, 86 years old and still hosts our family. Not right now, sadly, but, uh, and you know, 30, 40 people at a time. And that was the way she showed her love was through food. And that was really kind of how I felt too. I wanted to bring people around my table to create community around food. And, and I couldn't eat the, you know, chicken and steamed broccoli for the rest of my life. So I started getting into the kitchen and just recreating a lot of things that I grew up eating, you know, trans like substituting out things for the regular dinner, you know, recipes that I grew up eating. Um, and then got into the baked goods. And my husband was the one who suggested starting a blog. He just was like, you should start a blog. And so he set me up with the WordPress and we, you know, I just started snapping photos of the things I was creating with my phone and I was sharing the recipes with neighbors and coworkers and they were all giving good feedback on them and they were all asked for the recipes. And so I was like, well, it's an easier way to just type it up and, you know, put it up there and they can use it and I don't have to hand it out to multiple people. Um, and it was also just a way to kind of catalog my journey and then eventually became a way to connect with other people who were suffering like I was. Um, when I first started it, I just figured it would be like my grandma, my mom, and my sister that were reading it. Um, but I started a Facebook page, I think around 2011 and started publishing the recipes there and just started seeing it grow and grow. And I think probably the biggest thing that I noticed where people were feeling the same, they just like really wanted the, to be able to enjoy those pastimes, um, especially other parents and things like that. Um, but that also they just needed to find somebody who knew what they were going through. And that's what I felt like I needed too. I didn't have anybody in my life that was walking the same journey of going through an autoimmune disease. And so I think we just kind of formed this community and this bond, which I've been so grateful for over the years. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it started. It just it started with just me in the kitchen, just experimenting. <laughs> that, it's so cool. And then, and so that kind of blossomed into these four cookbooks that you've written at this point. 
Yeah, yeah, it did. So about a year or so after I started the blog, I got a call from a publisher and they offered me a deal. And um, the story I thought was cool was because the, the woman who worked there's son had an autoimmune disease and he was young and he went to a school where they had cereal day every week and he couldn't do grains and he felt super left out. And I have this um, granola recipe that's like soaked and sprouted nuts that are dehydrated uh, and, you know, sweetened with honey. And so she would make that for him and send it with almond milk or something like that or, ca or um, coconut milk. And he felt like he could be part of the celebration every week again. And so she showed my blog to the publisher and that's how my first book came, came about. And then it went on from there. <laughs> that's amazing. How do you, yeah. you mentioned that you have, uh, you have three kids. I mean, I, I don't have any, I, do. I don't have, I don't have any kids that I know of at least. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I, I, this is not a topic that I, that I can speak to, um, particularly well, but how do you balance, like, how do you you know, balance being a mom, having three kids around, you know, having these dietary restrictions with, um, yeah. with, uh, with, with kids who basically want to eat whatever is pleasurable to them. <laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting journey. So for my first son, you know, at first I just didn't realize, like I was changing everything about the way I was eating, but I was still doing all the normal quote unquote things that most American parents do for their kids, like buying the, you know, box flaked oatmeal or rice cereal that you mix up or giving them, you know, all the like cheese crackers, the fish crackers, just all those things that I just were like, oh, okay. Um, and then I started moving into kind of like, okay, well, I should at least get organic versions of those. Um, and it, so it was a kind of a slow process, but then after time, I just realized like, if this is as important to my body as it is, and I started learning more and more about how autoimmune diseases can be hereditary. Um, my children were also born via C-section, which can make them even more susceptible to it. And so it really became a passion of mine to make sure that I tried to prevent at, at all costs that they would get what I had. Um, so my younger two have just kind of been raised on it. Like they know spaghetti squash and they know, you know, I mean, that's like, they don't know normal noodles. <laughs> um, they do a little bit. I always say, you know, they're a hundred percent gluten-free 85% of the time they eat grain free paleo kind of diet, but then I'll buy like some whole brown rice pasta for them because they can tolerate it. Um, and it doesn't seem to bother them, but we do no artificial sugars, no artificial food dyes, you know, I mean, everything's pretty, pretty clean. Um, but that's partially why I became passionate about recreating the things like the cupcakes and the cookies and things because, you know, I mean, they're going to be exposed to that kind of stuff. And it doesn't matter how much you tell a five year old that it's the best for them that they don't eat it. It's like they need to at least feel like they're part of it. And so I send, you know, my own cupcakes to school for them or they keep like a, a, a bag in the freezer of something of mine so that when there's a party at school, they can like pull it out. Um, and that just that was very apparent early on as like even a preschooler, you know, sending different snacks to school and just how they they as they're growing up, they're learning how to be part of society and how, you know, to be part of the world. And it's really surprising how much food is a part of that and how you can really feel ostracized, you know, based on how you eat. And I'm like, I felt it as an adult, so I can't even imagine a little one. So we talk a lot, I mean, about my disease. Unfortunately, they have seen me, you know, bedridden at times here and there. They've seen me sick. And so without trying to scare them, you know, we talk about why it's important that we eat this way and that it helps mommy stay healthy so that I can be, you know, there for them. And I think they, they really understand it. I mean, again, like they're going to be 16 and they're going to go to a friend's house and probably down like four boxes of mac and cheese. And it's going to happen at some point. Like I know it's going to, um, but the biggest thing for me is trying to help them see the correlation of how their body feels after they eat things. Um, we've had those circumstances here and there over the years of like going to a movie with a friend and getting the candy and popcorn and coming home and feeling gross and their stomach hurts. And, you know, I try to tell them like, Hey, you know, did you feel like that before you went to the movie and before you ate that? And so just really trying to just to show them to like, listen to their bodies. That's kind of the way I've tried to approach it. And they're going to make bad decisions, but my hope is that the foundation that's laid and just trying to understand from a young age that food can make you feel a certain way, but good or bad, um, that they'll hopefully, hopefully make good decisions as they get older. <laughs> I love that. Like a, a gentle coaxing. Is yeah, really, yeah, exactly. Is all exactly. it takes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I ate tons of crap growing up. I, I know. Same. <laughs> tons, like McDonald's. I ate. Yep. I remember, like, just like, God, Lunchables, Dunkaroos. Oh like, yeah. 
fruit roll oh, yeah, ups, all pop of it. tarts. We cereal. must have grown up around the same time because those were all the things. Yes, all of them. <laughs> Pizza pockets or hot pockets. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my mom was like the queen of frozen processed foods. And that was our, I feel like our generation. That's just, you know, it's stuff we grew up on. Sometimes I poke fun at her and I'm like, you wonder why I have this disease. But it's something they couldn't, you know, they didn't know any better. But yeah, I, I had the friends, you know, I feel like we all had, especially kids who grew up in like the 90s. We all had that one friend whose mom was very like super strict. They never ate chocolate. They only ate carob or they only ate like the whole grains or they were never allowed this or that. And then you went to college with that friend and they like <laughs> nose, you know, just like nose dive, ate all the things. And, you know, and so I'm like my, my thought with raising my kids, I'm like, I'm not going to try to, dep I'm not, I don't want to deprive them. I don't want them to go off and like try to rebel and go the other direction. I want to like bring them into it. They cook a lot with me. I want to talk with them. Like I want to, you know, try to have them have this understanding and belief of it, that it's not just something that like I'm imposing on them. Yeah. I love that. How do you handle, uh, eating out? going to restaurants. Yeah. Well, so I live in the Bay Area, so I'm pretty fortunate in that like most of the restaurants around here are really accommodating. I mean, I feel like from when I was diagnosed, especially where you would say gluten-free and they'd look at you like you had like five heads <laughs> um, to now even understanding grain-free. So, you know, I mean, most menus these days have it listed what things can be modified or what's gluten free. Thankfully, I don't have celiac, so I can eat in a place that's cross contaminated. I'm not that sensitive to gluten, at least. Um, but when I travel, which I do a lot for work normally, uh, not this year, I tend to find places that I that I, I, I spend a lot of time on Yelp. My friends always make fun of me because I'm like looking for lunch when we're at breakfast of like, okay, where can we go that's safe? Um, but I like to try to find places that I know have good quality, like grass fed meats and organic, you know, poultry and local organic vegetables. And then I know like, okay, I can, I can probably modify something if they're like at least focusing on quality. Um, worst case scenario, if I'm like stuck, you know, I'll get a salad and I'll just do olive oil and lemon juice or I'll get a lettuce wrap burger or something if like I'm, I'm stuck and I just can't. But um, for the most part around here, we can eat pretty easily and we can actually really enjoy a lot of the places, which I'm, I'm super grateful for. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I feel like California, we're so lucky living in the state, you know, in, yes. in many ways. Um, yes. <laughs> in, in the sense that we, you know, it really is the, the epicenter of the healthy, you know, holistic food movement, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Um, yeah. in the U S and it has been for, it has been that way for decades. Right. Right. And everything's so fresh too. I mean, it's like our produce and it's like, we can get mostly everything year round. I mean, we're, yeah, we're very fortunate in that way. And there's such, I mean, I think it was, this is where like the farm to table, you know, kind of movement originally kind of started, I feel like just with everything being local and fresh and that's such a priority. And, um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely easier here than it is in some places in the Midwest and the South. That's for sure. So you've talked about how you've been able to adapt some of your indulgences to your new lifestyle, you know, all the, all the baked goods that that pepper your Instagram so beautifully. What about uh, what's your take on on alcohol and how that affects uh, ulcerative colitis? Yeah, so I don't do any grain based alcohol, clearly, um, although I am somewhat of the mind that it's kind of not fermented, but, um, distilled out, but still I kind of stay away from it. I just don't know how it's going to react. Um, I occasionally will do a hundred percent agave tequila. I like a good margarita that's made with honey. That's like one, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do something as a drink, like I'll make something like that. Um, I love a glass of red wine. I I've, you know, over the last five or six years, I've realized that if I drink a glass that's organic and biodynamic and doesn't have any added sugars and the sulfates and the coloring that I can tolerate it just fine. I mean, again, it's like if I'm noticing any sort of symptoms, I just stay away from any of that stuff because it does still have, you know, natural sugars. And, um, but yeah, again, I'm like, I'm 35 minutes from the Napa Valley. So I'm definitely, I love a good glass of wine. Um, but I don't, you know, none of the sugary like cocktails or mixers or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I think on I think on occasion, I, I mean, maybe I don't, I don't even do a, a drink a week. I would say maybe a couple times a month, I have a glass of something, but I'm not I'm not too strict on that. Yeah, I think like in so far as alcohol has this ability to reduce stress for people, you know. Yeah, that's right, like a non-trivial right. benefit of drinking alcohol, even though alcohol <laughs> itself is a toxin, right? It's like <laughs> right. we live these stressed out lifestyles you know like 2020 right. was a stressful year right. um and you know and i'm not being in a, a like i'm not 
I don't think alcohol needs me to, to come out in its defense, but like, <laughs> but you know, when you have an autoimmune condition and stress can, you know, lead to flare ups, it's like, it's nice to know that right. you can have like a glass of wine at the end of the day. Right. Right. And I actually, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I think, I mean, I'm sure it's somewhat controversial. I do some CBD, which I think helps with stress as well. And that might be a little safer than alcohol, but yeah, I have not noticed it. I mean, I definitely hear from people with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's that alcohol or wine can really bother their systems. Um, but when I switched to like quality wine that, that I knew was grown and harvested and produced in, in a way that wouldn't affect me, I've actually noticed a pretty significant difference. Hmm. So, but again, like I can't do too much. I mean, I need to, it's with, it's within moderation for me, but yes, 2020, a glass of wine at the end of the day with three kids at home and trying to run a business. It's, it's definitely been a stress reliever. That's for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. When it comes to baking, what are some of your favorite, I don't know, things to make f ingredients to use? Uh, I dabble in baking, you know, yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say <laughs> that I'm a pro by any means, but, um, but you know, I've got some like recipes that I've gotten pretty good at, um, yeah. over, over time. So like, yeah, what are, what I are some of your go-tos? It depends. I, I used to use a ton of almond flour, um, which I, I mean, I still use here and there, but I've noticed so many people have nut allergies. I've actually noticed that if I go overboard on like the nut flours too, that I can, I can kind of backtrack a little bit. Um, I use coconut flour. I like arrowroot starch or arrowroot powder here and there just to kind of give something like a more kind of pliable texture and a little bit of a crunch. Um, my favorite sweeteners would be raw, just like very, very light colored honey. That's my favorite. I think um, I love the flavor of honey, but you don't want to overpower it. Uh, maple sugar, pure maple sugar has been one of my favorite kind of new finds in the last couple years. Like there are just certain things you can't get without a granulated sugar in terms of texture. Um, and so I've loved using that um, palm, you know, coconut sugar. It's like it's been great to use and that's been around for so long, but it's very dark. It's like more like brown sugars. So maple sugar has been one of my favorite things to be able to recreate like sprinkles for my kids. Like you, I couldn't do that before that or um, like, you know, French macarons. Like there's just certain things that you just can't, you can't get. But um, I'm trying to think what else. I do, um, I love to use nut butters just because they're already super smooth and you don't get that kind of like gritty grainy texture that you can get with some of the flowers. So I use that a lot, like almond butter or sunflower seed butter in muffins or in breads, things like that. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of it. I'm like, those are like the main things in my, in my pantry. I like it. Well, have you not dabbled with like some of these like sugar free, you know, calorie free sugar alternatives? like uh, erythritol, monk fruit, stevia. What are yeah. your thoughts on those? So I, 100% stevia, I think, is fine. I'm not a huge fan of the sugar alcohols. They, mm. my, my body doesn't tend to like them. I also just don't like the flavor. Mm. <laughs> um, I feel like they have such an interesting aftertaste. So I don't use them much. Stevia occasionally, but I kind of prefer like the just the regular like honey, maple syrup, those types of things. And dates. I use a lot of dates. That's another sweetener that I use. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know. I... I, you know, I like, I'll use erythritol, doesn't upset my stomach at all. But I know that some, yeah. some sugar alcohols have a very pronounced, you know, GI, like distress effect. Yeah, but it I, might be why for me. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, interesting. Again, I'm like, everybody's different. Everybody's different. I don't know if you know this. This is something that I thought was very interesting. Prunes are very high in, I believe it's sorbitol, which is a sugar alcohol. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, which is why oh. prunes are such a well-known, they have this like well-known laxative effect. Right, It's yes, not because of the fiber in the prunes. It's because of that huh. sugar alcohol. So if you look at, and and what's funny is that you'll look at like, you know, if you go to Trader Joe's or whatever, you can find these like sugar-free chocolate bars or whatever. They're loaded yes. with they sorbitol. Have sorb yeah, right, yeah. right. And so it's it's no funny. My husband will probably be so mad at me for saying this, but I didn't even, I had never heard the word sorbitol until he told me that it bothered his stomach. He doesn't have any autoimmune disease, nothing, but um, he used to chew gum that had sorbitol in it and he would notice, like he would get very gassy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and that's when I first realized, I was like, oh, I wonder if, you know, some of these other ones might be causing that with me. So, I mean, you know, it's all about like trying to listen to your body and hear the different things. But um, yeah, I think, I'm, I'm like, I'm open to some of them. I think the biggest problem for me, I get a lot of fans asking, like, can I substitute in stevia? Can I substitute in monk fruit? And the problem is a lot of the 
the brands that are out there have so many extra things in them. I'm like, it's pretty difficult to, you have to really seek out and look at the ingredients to find like a pure monk fruit sweetener that doesn't have a bunch of other stuff in it. And same for the stevia. But um, yeah, I mean, I occasionally have this like powdered 100% stevia that's just like the ground leaves that I think works really well. That's probably my favorite alternative if I were to use it. That's awesome. You mentioned that you make, you've made sprinkles for your kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I have. <laughs> um, there, they were for one of my books. It was my. I have a book called "Eat What You Love," and the whole premise around it was just everything that you would want to eat that you can. That's you know, grain and dairy and and refined sugar free. So yes, I made sprinkles. I was making a frosting at one point with like um like a royal icing that I would have you know you would have used to make sugar cookies. Um, and it's typically an egg white base. Um, that has powdered sugar in it. And that's when it kind of crisps up at the end. And so I, I was making a frosting. I was testing out recipes with the egg whites and with a little starch and some maple sugar. And when it dried, I was like, oh, this actually has the texture of like a sprinkle. So I started doing some, you know, um, natural like food colorings with beets and with blueberries and dyeing them and um, piping them out. And then you just chop them up. And it's a little bit of a process, but for like your kids who just want to, you know, they see their friends eating sprinkles on ice cream or on top of cookies or something like that it was it was a fun one to kind of figure out and I was like oh you can actually make sprinkles it's not that hard <laughs> man how lucky are your kids Jesus <laughs> well I mean I'm sure they probably feel lucky and unlucky actually I don't think they even appreciate it that's let's be honest I'm like it's just normal for them so you know <laughs> so funny so you've got this new digital cooking course coming out um, yes. that I'm sure your followers are excited for what's that about yeah, you know, it's something that I've been wanting to do for a really long time, and 2020 kind of gave me that opportunity. <laughs> um, I obviously none of us are traveling, and that's what takes up a lot of my time. But um, traveling for me is a chance to connect with the people who follow me, who buy the books, who have followed the recipes, um, who have seen you know major change in their lives because of the the shifts in their diet. And so I've really missed that part specifically. Um, but then we also just really found over the years that a lot, I mean, and I, I was at the beginning too, a lot of people are really intimidated by cooking in a, with a total, in a totally new lifestyle with different ingredients. And we, you know, when I will make something on my Instagram and show how, how easy and how normal it looks, but like it actually looks like good, good food when it comes out. Um, we see so many more people that are willing to take the risk of trying it themselves. Like, so all of a sudden, you know, like I'll see thousands of people post the same recipe that I made the day before because it inspires them and they see like, oh, you know, coconut aminos, they look like soy sauce. Like at first I was worried because I didn't know what that was, but they look, you know, like the food that I remember or like that, you know, that dinner looks exactly like the regular dinner that I grew up eating. And so I've really wanted to create this community um, of, you know, like-minded people who have health in mind, who want to eat healthier, but might be intimidated by cooking for their family or for themselves, uh, and that really want to learn how to cook. I mean, you can't go to culinary school. You can't watch the Food Network and see this way of cooking. Uh, and so this was kind of my way of getting to do that and really getting to be in people's kitchens with them. It's going to be a lot different than what I do on a day-to-day -day basis on my social media. You know, it's like, we're really cooking through the recipe together. We're not editing a three to five minute cooking video. Like we're, we're going to show the whole, you know, 20, 30 minute process of this. We're going to talk about the tips and tricks of what to look for in the grocery store and what something looks like, you know, when it's almost done and what it looks like when it's undercooked and they just really get to see the full process. Uh, and then there's going to be a lot more in terms of like a, a really forming a community. Um, when I went on my book tour for my last book, what I noticed as I visited each city was that there were so many people that came out to the event alone. Um, they drove, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours, and they didn't come with anybody because they didn't have anybody that, you know, was interested in it. They didn't have that support system. And so I started to just have this idea of like, gosh, wouldn't it be so cool if we could, there's 400 people sitting in this room that obviously all care about this. Like, couldn't we connect you all where you can give each other tips, you know, about like, oh, well, I found coconut, you know, crystals, coconut milk at this store in this aisle, or this restaurant's really accommodating to, you know, gluten-free or grain-free. And 
where people in individual places could really also kind of form a community and, and where they could become each other's resources and connect over that. So that's kind of the hope and the goal of all of this is not only will they be learning to cook with me um, and cooking with me, but that they're also all the participants will kind of form this community together where they can really empower each other and, and really encourage each other and um, kind of inspire each other to try the recipes or to try something new or substitute something in if they can't have it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, that's kind of the hope and, and really just giving people more of like an inside look at kind of my day to day tips and tricks that I've learned over the last 12 years of cooking this way and making it a profession, but also having three kids and just like my tips on, you know, batch cooking dinners and freezing things and just all of, all of that, like really more, a more intricate look into kind of what my real kitchen and my life looks like. That's amazing. I'm sure that that course is gonna be so valuable to people who take it. I didn't know this about you prior to doing the research, you know, on you leading up, <laughs> leading up to this, uh, you know, to, to our chat, but you're a self-taught chef. You're a self-taught chef who has three, you know, four cookbooks, three of which are New York Times bestseller, bestsellers, which is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so great. I mean, so inspiring to anybody out Thank there you. listening who aspires to do something in the world of food, um, you know, and, and chefery. But what are some things that you know now that you wish you knew about cooking back when you first started? Oh, gosh. I think, you know, I mean, I think one of the biggest things for me was, yeah, I wasn't trained. I didn't go to school. I really never veered from a recipe. So I think probably the biggest thing for me is to take risks and to like experiment. I think people are so afraid that if they go off of a recipe at all, that it won't you know, won't work and it'll flop. Baking, you know, is, that's a little bit more tricky, but like for dinners, I just feel like people don't feel like they have the freedom to take a recipe and kind of make it their own. So I think that would be my biggest advice was just to have some fun with it and to not feel like you really have to, you know, stay within the guidelines. I mean, obviously don't change anything significant, but like swap your vegetables that you like in, or if you need to use stuff up in your fridge, you know, do that. Um, I think the other big thing that I've learned, especially, you know, with trying to run a business full time and having kids is to just really try to plan ahead. I mean, my early days, I think I had good intentions, but I would like go into the grocery store without a plan and end up with so much food at the house that I would end up wasting, you know, two weeks down the road that I'd find in the fridge. And I'm like, oh, I, I thought I was going to use that, but I didn't. So I've really used meal planning a lot more, even if it's a little bit of a loose meal plan for me. But just just that I'm buying things intentionally, that I have ideas for what to use them for. Also, like just using them up, you know, when I see something that's about to go bad, I just really like if I didn't have a recipe, you know, just to like throw it into something and use it up. That's probably the other thing, too, because it's just I mean, eating this way is expensive for people at first. But I honestly think one of the biggest reasons why it's so costly is these people. I think there's a lot of food waste. <laughs> I think it's a way to really get it down, you know, to to more be to be more budget friendly. Yeah, absolutely. Meal prep is such a great way to, you know, stay on track in terms of your health goals, in terms of your budgetary yep. goals. Any other any other mistakes that you'd routinely make back then? I just, you know, I feel like for new chefs, one of the things that I notice, <laughs> for example, I'll go first, is that people tend to under salt foods. Oh, yes. They under they tend sure. to under season. That's one of the yes. major reasons why I think so many children grow up, become adults that have this aversion to vegetables. Because their parents yeah. didn't make them taste good because yeah, they, they, they yeah they tasted <laughs> terrible growing up. Yeah. I was very lucky in that my mom always you know made vegetables very well seasoned. She you know she yeah did a great job there. But any any like things like that. Oh my gosh! I mean, I I totally echo you on that. That's one thing I learned over the years is you have to, and you also have to season in layers. Like you season as you go because it builds on the flavors, you know. And and yeah, I'm like I'm always I I like to do it as you go. I, but I do always say I'm like. Go as you, you know, go as you go and you can always add more at the end. You can't take it out. So that's the only thing I always caution people. I'm like, don't dump two teaspoons in at the beginning because then you're screwed and you can't fix it. Yeah. But I do, I utilize a ton of fresh herbs and, and dried spices. I think they can make any meal just to have so much more vibrancy and flavor, you know, that might otherwise be a little bit boring. Um, but yeah, I think too, you know, and as a mom, like don't underestimate, you know, your palate and don't just take, turn something off because you don't think you'll like it or they'll like it. I, there was, you know, one thing that I used to make all the time when my, when my 10 year old was, was two. And it was just this really simple curry dish that with like five or six different vegetables with a little coconut milk and like six different dried, dried spices. 
was um, kind of more of an Indian Thai. Well, it was like a mix between an Indian and a Thai curry. But um, I would always eat it at lunch, and I'd give him his normal, you know, like finger foods and things. And he took a bite of it one time and ended up downing the whole bowl. And I just thought it wasn't spicy, but it, I mean, it had spices. It had turmeric and it had ginger and you know cumin and coriander and. I never in my, you know, wildest dreams would have thought a two year old would like that. And so after that, I really started having that, you know, thing of like, just try a bite. And it's kind of the same for adults, you know, like even if it's something that might be a little bit different flavor profile than what you're used to, give it a shot, like try it one time and see, cause it could really, you know, expand what your, what your taste buds are used to. And you might end up finding that you love it. The spices are so great, herb spices. That they also add like negligible calories to your food, you know. Whereas, right. <laughs> whereas so like true. sauces and dressings, uh, yes. you can, you can, you're easily loading on the oil, the sugar, and things like that, you know. Yes. So great, great to totally. know how to wield a spice in the kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. What, at what age? Yeah, and don't be afraid to mix them. That's the other thing too. I'm like, don't just go with one. Like, mix a bunch of different ones because that's like where the where the flavor bombs come from. <laughs> Interesting. What do you have any any favorite combinations? You know what? I have the weirdest combination. I have this recipe on my site that's called burnt. I call it burnt broccoli, and it's because a friend of my husband he, he used to roast broccoli and like practically burn it, like charred roasted broccoli. And uh, I started doing it, but adding this like lemon juice and this whole spice mix. And it's, it's when you look at the spices, you wouldn't think that it would taste good together, but it's so good. Um, it has, it has cumin, coriander, cinnamon, just like a teeny bit of cinnamon, um, turmeric. I'm trying to think what else is in it, but that's kind of like, I love, I love, I love coriander and cumin together for sure. And then mm. I usually kind of tried to add a couple others in there, but yeah, I definitely, those would be some of my favorites. Love that. So important. Um, at what age can you, because I know you're not supposed to give, and you've gone through this three times, babies salt, right? But you can give them yeah. like other, other spices are okay. And at what age yeah. can, you, can you start to give them salt? Yeah, salt, um, gosh, I think, you know, I mean, I think it's okay. I think they worry about them. I think they worry about dehydration, but also that they'll like, turn down any food that's not <laughs> salty. Hmm. So I didn't salt a lot of foods, but I put, I started putting spices in like if, I mean, for my first two, I did purees. We did like a baby led weaning for my third one, which is like where they're picking up pieces. But I would sprinkle uh, cinnamon. I would sprinkle, you know, like, I mean, all sorts of different things on their food just to get them used to all of the different flavors. Um, and I mean, not a lot, just a little bit, but, um, yeah, I mean, Babies, I mean, they're, they're obviously new to it. And so, you know, but like boring, bland food is, is not really fun for anybody. I mean, at the beginning, yes, like just the very simple things. But I think in order to get them to try things and like things and not always just want them bland, you have to start introducing it. I mean, it depends when your kids start eating. But usually after a couple months of solid foods is when I would start sprinkling different spices and seasonings in there. What do you do if they don't want? you know, a, a, a given food, like what, what are your, what are your coercion methods? Yeah. I mean, it depends when they're babies and they're like newly eating, they're just, they're going to take and pick up what they want and they're going to put in their mouth what they want. So there's not a whole lot you can do there. Um, I really did find with my last, my third one with that, the, they call it baby led weaning. It's, I didn't exactly follow it to a T, but serving them what we were eating was hmm. huge for me, um, for them to see it on my plate and just to have it, you know, being on their tray, but looking slightly different and really just giving them that kind of ownership and control over it, that there's four things on their tray and they can choose which one to pick up. I felt like that was super helpful. Um, but really, I think for my kids, you know, as, as they got older, for me, I think the, the, the biggest ticket to getting them to try things is getting them in the kitchen with you mm -hmm. um, or getting them into the garden if you can have a small garden. Like when we first planted, I mean, we had two beds. It wasn't huge, just small little, you know, like square beds. But we grew vegetables that, Again, I think a lot of parents underestimate what their kids will like and they just, you know, buy like the standard, you know, kid vegetables or like, and we planted, you know, snow peas and we planted cucumbers and we planted tomatoes. And I just remember watching like them planting them as a seed and then having them grow and get to pick them. They took bites right then and there in the garden because it was like, I made this <laughs> and cucumbers are now all three of my kids. They walk around with like the little baby cucumbers and just eat them like, like an apple 
in my house. And I'm like, I don't think I would have bought cucumbers for my kids, honestly. Like I just, it's not something I always think of those being in salads. And I just don't think I would have like given them as a snack. So I think getting them in, involved, whether it's the growing, it's the tasting. I mean, like I have my kids smell the spices before we put them in stuff. Um, I have them, you know, taste things. Just, I just think it's, it's, it's really helpful for them to get to see the process, you know, whatever it is, because it's like they have this ownership over it of like, oh, I like I helped with that. I made that. And, and it, it also really it sparks their curiosity because it's like they saw it, you know, being made and they're like, well, I want to see what it tastes like, you know, and, and they don't always like it. And that's fair. Like, it's you know, for me, I'm like, OK, you tried it. And then and if they don't like it, usually what I'll do is not, you know, not let them eat. They don't have to eat it, but we'll try it again, like in a few months or a year because they're they're palettes especially when they're young are like constantly changing I mean one of the things I always I always tell parents when they're feeling like super frustrated and they'll look at you know I mean they'll look at my kids and I'll be like I I write cookbooks for a living but I still have a normal like picky child like it's just it's part of growing up kids just do it it's like them figuring out their voice and you know um but they will eat, I mean, my kids would eat at two, they'd eat salmon and they'd eat asparagus, and they eat, like anything I put on their plates. But then three weeks later, they'd be tossing it off and like completely refusing it. So they just go through cycles. And I think, you know, just constantly reintroducing and retrying things is huge. I love that. I was a very picky eater growing up. And my mom always, used so to, my, mom, my mom, <laughs> she always used to tell me in a, in a loving, smirking, humorous way, she had a great sense of humor. Uh, not so not in a reprimanding way that if I wasn't that if I, I didn't become more experimental with food that I'd yeah. be, that I'd be boring you know as an adult <laughs> and I you know and I never wanted to be boring so she would that's how she yep. would get me to try new things like sushi and you know yep. more, you know more exotic dishes and the like so yeah, I like that. I know I tell my, my oldest is our pickiest. Um, my younger two are very adventurous. They try pretty much anything. Um, they don't always like it, but they at least try it. My oldest, I always joke with him because I'm like for probably the first like six or seven years of his life, he didn't like chocolate. And I'm like, if you would, and now he loves, I mean, now he loves it and he'll, you know, ice cream or whatever. And I'm like, if you would have never tried that, you would never have known you liked it and look at how much you'd be missing out. <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm like, what if you love this vegetable or what if you love this dinner? You know? So I like try to kind of equate it to that too. I'm like, how will you know if you like something or how will you know if you're not missing out on something unless you at least give it a shot? So that's kind of our rule. I'm not like a clean your plate type of mom. I'm like, you know, give it a shot. And then our, our, our typical rule for dinner, if it's something new is like, if they don't like something, they don't, if they try it, they don't have to finish it, but they can have more of whatever else I'm serving. I'm not going to go into the kitchen and make them something else. It's like, you can have, you know, if you, if you, if you don't like the meat, but you love the broccoli, you can have a plate of broccoli for dinner. Like that's, that's it. I'm not making a second dinner. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. Is the idea of eating real food that doesn't have an ingredient list, that isn't ultra processed, that isn't hyper palatable things that come in boxes. I still think that that makes a lot of sense and it makes a lot of sense as a starting point for a lot of people. And then you can, you can do your tweaking and your personalizing from there. But you know, whether you like the name or not, I still think it, it's a good starting point.